I bring you also the message from Osage Okumbo, who will traditionally be here with you and with all of us, but for some other business exigencies, is unavoidably absent. The Oloibiri Lecture Series and SB in Nigeria has a very strong partnership with Shell. And Oloibiri in particular also is a signature for Shell. And um, it is our desire and commitment to continue to partner with SBE as we have done in the past years. The current year's uh, meeting and session cannot come at a better time than today. The whole world is looking towards uh, low carbon energy in the near future. We have been ravaged by uh, COVID pandemic in the last one year. And our own government aspiration for $10 per barrel unit production cost that even came and started before the pandemic. If you join all this together, you would then understand that the theme of this year's session and lecture series couldn't have come at a better time. It is then our dear sincere belief that by the time we are done here today, we will come out with a very strong blueprint that will help our oil and gas industry in Nigeria to foster. Having said that, I would say that Shell. I should say that this thing will distract her if she feels herself. And in the because current year, even in the hybrid form, we will continue to do this even in the near future. SB has been the foundation and the bedrock for major institutional changes in the country. And that helps the oil and gas industry to grow. As we are now charting a path to a new energy and to the transition, it becomes very imperative that at this point in time, we all pull together to make sure that we build a very resilient industry for our own dear country. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank you for making our time to be part of this event today. And please stay tuned and stay connected irrespective of where you are because it promises to be a very impressive session. On that note, I would like to thank you very much for this and then we'll hear from you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sam Izukori, General Manager Development for Shell, representing Mr. Osagi Okubo, and he has said it all. You'll hear from him again when he takes that um, industry, the lecture address on behalf of his um, country chair. Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, from the room here, I go over now to Zoom, where our next and final speaker for sponsorship is waiting to address us. I pass it on now to the Managing Director and Chief Executive Office of Walter Smith Petroman Oil Limited, Mr. Chikizie Mosu. If you can hear me, the stage is all yours. Okay, morning. Uh, I'm actually uh, representing uh, Chike Mosu uh, on this. Uh, so my name is Alex, Alex Osho, uh, CFO at Walter Smith. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Alex. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, His Excellency, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources. Uh, we thank you for joining us, uh, the director or CEO, uh, the DPR, and all our eminent, eminent guests uh, invited. Thank you very much. Uh, Walter Smith is delighted to partner with the Society of Petroleum Engineers as a major sponsor of the SPE Library Lecture Series and Energy Forum, OLEF 2021. Uh, Walter Smith is one of the Nigeria's leading independent energy EMP companies and one of the pioneering marginal field producers after having successfully participated in the marginal field uh, bid round of 2001. We started out uh, winning the big field in 2003, uh, taking over the asset in 2004 and achieving first oil in 2008. And we have successfully continuously produced since then, working with a homegrown but well-trained team of Nigerian professionals who have both domestic and international experience. 
We have produced cumulatively over 40 million barrels from the Bigway field since first oil, reaching the peak of 7,000 barrels per day in 2016 and averaging around 5,000 barrels per day over the last one year. We are a firm believer in Nigeria, importantly, and one of our recent pioneering moves is to embark on building out an integrated energy platform with the recent commissioning of a 5,000 barrel per day modular refinery, one of the few key pioneering projects in expanding Nigeria's domestic refining capacity and eventual energy independence. For us, we believe that at least for Africa, for Nigeria, energy transition starts with domestic energy independence. And today we're part of a group with ambitions in power, renewable energy and infrastructure. And we have begun charting a course towards creating a sustainable and optimized portfolio of activities. And also we've been very active in collaboration and advocacy. And to this extent, we are, we're extremely active within the oil producers trade section, OPTS, and the independent petroleum producers group, IPPG. And in fact, one of the co-founders of Walter Smith is the current chairman of uh, IPPG. At the same time, we're longtime collaborators with the SPE, as you may know. Our current CEO is the past uh, SPE president. And the reason for our involvement in advocacy is that we believe that we must constantly contribute to the critical conversations that will shape both the immediate and long-term features of not only our company, but also of the entire domestic energy industry. And this can be achieved through positive regulatory changes, corporate behavioral actions, or at least the directional intent. And the overarching topic in the recent years has been energy transition. This has been even further emphasized in the past one year with the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic has raised deep questions around the entire industry, questions around you know, accelerating the energy transition, questions around long-term impact and all demand and price, questions around access to funding for activities, and several other questions around cost optimization, portfolio optimization, sustainability, and operational excellence. You can choose to view these as existential threats, or you can choose to see this as op opportunities to develop a, a more robust and resilient business model. We at Walter Smith believe these provide opportunities for the latter, and that's why we have taken a keen interest in today's event. We look forward to engaging conversations from various viewpoints and possibly groundbreaking ideas from the various speakers. And at the end of the day, we look forward to receiving a clear sense of what needs to be done in the immediate term and also in the medium term to help our industry evolve with the times. Again, uh, thank you for joining us. And we are very proud to be associated with the OLEF 2021 event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Alex, right? That's the name? Yes, Alex. I think he's muted. All right, thank you so much. Representing your CEO, uh, taking the sponsor's remarks. Without wasting much time, we're continuing with the pro um, program now. From the sponsor's remark, we go to our first keynote address. And this first keynote address is on industry regulation, achieving operational excellence through efficient and effective regulation. Now, recently, the Department of Petroleum Resources commissioned their excellence, the Oil and Gas Excellence Center, and they have positioned themselves to become not just regulators, but enablers and economic stimulators for the oil and gas industry and for Nigeria. A lot of positive you know, changes has been going on with, within the DPR, empowering industry stakeholders especially indigenous industry stakeholders to take their position in ensuring operational excellence in the oil and gas industry. We're now being joined live via Zoom by the man who is leading all of these exciting changes at the Department of Petroleum Resources. Let's welcome the DPL's Director and Chief Executive Officer, Engineer Anwalu Saiki. Engineer Saiki, sir. Thank you very you much. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, uh, for this. Uh, I would like to say, uh, to start by, by thanking SPE. But first, let me uh, say to my, my leader, my boss, uh, 
the leader of the industry, His Excellency, Honorable Minister of State, uh, Chief to Mepri Silva. Uh, let me also welcome the Group Managing Director, ably represented uh, by the COO of Stream. Uh, the Executive Secretary also ably represented by his uh, GM strategy. And I will also welcome the captain of the industry, the MDs, CEOs here present, some represented. I also want to uh, welcome the leadership and, uh, and the members of the SPE. Also gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is actually my profound uh, honor and privilege to deliver the keynote address at this esteemed audience. Uh, this is a landmark gathering of eminent industry practitioners and stakeholders in our industry. And this 30th edition of SPE Olibri Lecture Series, uh, on whose account we are all gathered here today, whether physically or virtually, SPE has proven to be the leading light among the industry professional organization in posturing discourse on oil and gas matters and promoting engagement on contemporary energy issues. The SPE, the, 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 the importance we accord this, uh, this particular lecture, it really allowed me to take an excuse from a very important national assignment to be part of this. So it is for this reason that we join voices with our leader the Honorable Minister of State and all world meaning industry stakeholders to felicitate with the SPE on the attainment of this milestone of the Tactiers Olive ever since the inauguration session held in 1991. So we at the Department of Petroleum Resources are proud to be associated with this organization whose ideals of enabling the industry to meet world's energy demand in safe, environmentally responsible and sustainable manner are in alignment with those of the department, which include providing opportunities, enabling business in the Nigerian oil and gas sector. This year's theme, operational excellence and portfolio optimization, way forward for oil and gas industry post COVID-19, is not only relevant, but apt and timely in view of the current events on the global stage and international energy dynamics. It will be recalled that in the wake of the triple force of COVID-19, oil price crash and OPEC plus cut, which impacted the global petroleum industry, the department under the leadership of the Army Minister of State rolled out four strategic focus for the industry repositioning and business optimization. These measures were to ensure that the Nigerian oil and gas industry sur survive and thrive in the face of severe economic disruption and daunting challenges. The department has continued to monitor industry metrics and we are optimistic that the industry is emerging stronger with key indicators pointing northward. A note of caution in order, in order though, like that saying goes, the storm may be over, but the storms come and go, but storm is part of life. Accordingly, we need to keep our eyes on the ball to make concerted effort to wade through the fragile business environment by eliminating inefficiencies, reducing costs, building partnerships, and entrenching collaboration in the industry. I am confident that today's lecture series will be another platform to help us deepen understanding and ask critical ideas, share lessons and best practice in a bid to rewrite our history for the overall good of the industry. For us in the DPR, value, stability and sustainability of industry continue to be our watchwords. So this led me to the specific topic of the day, that is industry regulation, achieving operational excellence through efficient and effective regulation which you have graciously requested me to speak on. So it is probably fitting at this juncture to manage some of the perception of the use of word regulator. Throughout last year, we embarked on a perception management campaign 
to showcase the DPR as not just being a regulator. These efforts were to galvanize the industry and address any misconception of the department as a showstopper, deal breaker, or an iron fist enforcer of rules. At the same time on the internal front, we created a paradigm shift and placed a culture change and promoting a business enabling opportunity provider mandate of the department. So in view of this reason, today we run a progressive regulatory regime, a system that incentivizes compliance and reward performance, rather than emphasis on infraction and penalties. Like I usually say to my colleagues, we want more royalties, not penalties. We want to see compliance kudos rather than non-compliance notices. We want to catch our duty holders doing something right, not something wrong. In fact, our aim is to ensure that regulation and industry guidelines are issued and applied in a manner that reflect good oil field practice, internationally acceptable standard, and are responsive to challenging and changing industry dynamics and global realities. Hence, as industry regulator, business enabler, and an opportunity provider, we do our business in a way that incentivizes operational excellence, both in words and in deeds. Our definition, or one definition of operational excellence that resonates with us in, in DPR, is that operational excellence is achieved when every member of an organization can see the flow of value to the customer. For us, the term customers refers to two primary stakeholders. One, government, which include people, the government, the govern and the governance. Then two, industry. And we strive to flow value to each group. On the government front, the Department of Petroleum Resources takes seriously its mandate to optimize revenues for government, serve as principal advisor to government on petroleum matters and implement applicable policy direction. For instance, DPR continued to exceed government revenue target by emplacing system and pro processes that ensure transparency and accountability in oil and gas revenue generation, computation, collection, a reconciliation as well as legacy debt recovery. Last year alone, we have generated over 2 trillion Naira for this country. And we intend to exceed this value for this year, despite the triple force I mentioned for last year. All these are anchored on core principle of operational excellence that allows full flow of value to government. In the same vein, the industry is crucial stakeholder group for which flow of value is critical for investment, development, production, and continuous operation. The department is ever mindful of the need for growth in the industry for overall economic stability and sustainability. As such, we enable the business while ensuring that the rules of the game are adhered to with the prime objective of confirming that the business are run optimally, cost efficiently, safely, environmentally responsible, and in a manner that returns fair and equitable value to all stakeholders. So we thus achieve the desired flow of value to the industry through our service instrument, which uh, license, which guarantees the investment, our permits, which enable participation, and our approval, authorize the activities. To achieve improved industry performance and business optimization, the DPR has streamlined its process and leverage on technology to enhance value, reduce industry cost of operation and support business continuity. Today, most of our process are digitized through the DPR suite of business automation solution for data gathering and reporting, issuance of licenses, permits and approval, inspection process, reviews, audits, and so on. So it will interest you to note that all these processes are integrated on the DPR Enterprise Resource Planning Tool, which has a secured access to relevant stakeholders, 
a testament of the department drive for operational excellence. We will not have done justice to this topic on operational excellence and regulation if we do not mention the recently commissioned National Oil and Gas Excellence Center, which was done by Mr. President himself. And indeed, he is the Minister of Petroleum Resources. And this is an industry collab collaborative platform to drive safety, value, and cost efficiency in the Nigerian oil and gas industry. Permit me to quote Mr. President in his words, which he stated during the, during the time he commissioned the center. He said, quote, NOGEC will serve as oil and gas industry cost reduction center and hub for the best industry best practice, technical support and competence. NOGEC will also act as oil and gas techno economic bureau to support government and its entities in policy development and implementation effort. Further in his concluding message to the commissioning event, Mr. President said that he therefore, if I quote him, I say, I therefore charge you all to take full advantage of this excellent center to meet the challenges confronting the industry. So consequently, we enjoin all the industry participants, including the SPE, and similar organization to leverage the integrated resource complex to promote the core tenets of operational excellence, which includes safety, value, and cost efficiency. Let me conclude this mandate. Let me conclude with this mandate to the industry. As partners and value drivers, the Department of Petroleum Resources will only use regulation as a tool to allow industry to develop and operate their assets safely, reliably, sustainably, and cost effectively. The department would want to see and track the progress of the industry at building a culture of operational excellence in six key areas. One, HSC. We believe our business is maximum return with maximum safety uh, culture. So the HSC performance in a culture that put non, is non-negotiable emphasis on developing the highest standard of performance. Second is cost performance. This cost performance is the return on capital across the asset. We don't know two fields are same. So the cost may be different. We may have a target cost, but it has to be an optimal in a way that it will give maximum return on the capital without compromising the HSC. Number three, use of appropriate standards and system. We do believe standardizing across all our process operations and adopting of consistent standards across the business, it will be a measure of operational excellence. Number four is the continuous improvement culture, which is a striving to exceed the target. We observe that the industry is on continuous improvement culture. We want to use that to gauge the operational excellence. Number five is human capital development, core capabilities. SPE is among a key uh, uh, organization that believe in human capital development. And we can see within the last 30 years or more what SPE has done to our industry. So human capital de development is among the key uh, 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 major of operational excellence so that we can get the talent, export the talent across the region and to the entire world. Last but not the least, improve reputation. This improve reputation based on efficient operations and sustainable business practices. And we think is the time to start name and shame is the time to really look on how we can project people that really perform based on reputation. And DPR will regularly review the industry performance on operational excellence based on those six measures I've mentioned and provide appropriate feedback to the respective companies and the industry in general. On this note, may I once again appreciate the SPE Nigerian Council for giving me the honor to present this keynote address 
on our role in ensuring operational excellence and business optimization in the industry. We remain committed to enable business and providing opportunities to all investors, or freighters, service providers, and all related participants in the oil and gas industry. And this is done in the overriding national interest. Once again, while felicitating with SPE on this 30th milestone of Oloi Bree Lecture Series, and wishing all, I wish all, all of us, all of you here present and virtually present, fruitful deliberation. And I want you to please accept the expressions of my warm regard for me and my team from this historic city of Topo Badagri, which I am talking to you from, where I speak to you today. Thank you and God bless. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't know that you are also taking the excellence to Badagri, to Po Badagri. That's okay. That's a good job we're doing for our nation. Thank you so very much, sir. Working us through the six cardinal points on which the DPR currently judges operational excellence. We appreciate that. I'm sure by the time we get into the panel conversations, uh, our panel members will be touching base with uh, some of those things. It's also important to appreciate the DPR in helping the uh, nation achieve revenues uh, in excess of 2 trillion naira last year. I mean, that deserves a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Let's appreciate the DPR. Thank you so much, sir. Your Excellencies, a very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are continuing with the keynote address. As I said, uh, we have um, two of them. The next one we're going to take, we're taking from one of our industries captain who is not here with us. But when we talk about operational excellence. He's one of those leaders of industry that is committed to operational excellence. He, he helped the NMPC establish world class systems and processes for the sale and disposal of Nigerian crude oil and natural gas liquids, a led to optimization of values and transparency of transactions uh, conducted on behalf of the corporation and the federation at large. At the NMPC, he is today reputed as Mr. Transparency leading the charge in removing some what people call opaqueness in the operations of the NMPC. But he's not here with us in person. Um, he is ably represented. By the way, I speak of our GMD, uh, Mr. Melekiari F. Nape, who is not able to join us. But not to worry, the man who wears the shoe on truly driving down cost and optimizing um, value in the industry is in the room with us. So I think we'll have the right person to talk to us. But before I do that, please, let me recognize this gentleman who the minister, as you're all aware, joined us via Zoom. But when you are a public servant, you serve a lot of people, including your bosses. Um, we've been told that the minister was called into another meeting. Hence, he logged off on Zoom. But because of his commitment to the theme and to SPE, he did the needful and sent his chief of staff to represent him here in person and take his address. I want to welcome Engineer Musi Salamidi. Good morning, sir. Welcome. And of course, one of his advisors is also in the room with us, uh, Mr. Justice Derefaka. You're welcome, Mr. Derefaka. That definitely underscores the minister's commitment to the SBA. Your Excellency is very distinguished, ladies and gentlemen. I was speaking of the GMD, whose address is on keynote address, is on operational excellence and portfolio optimization, promoting energy sustainability by responsibly deriving optimal value from oil and gas assets post-COVID. Representing him is the Chief Operating Officer, Engineer Adokie Tomomie, fellow Nigerian Society of Engineers and fellow Nigerian Society of Chemical Engineers. Let's welcome this current registered engineer as he speaks on behalf of the GMD. Thank you, thank you very much. On behalf of the GMD of NMPC, I welcome you all. I bring sincere appreciation from the group of NMPC. I've been personally here at the Association for this five years because of the exigencies of the job. He's unable to be, he's unable to attend this uh, gathering. 
he has asked me to speak on his behalf. So let me tip off the protocols, uh, standing on existing ones. The Honorable Minister of State, my brother, was Chief D.P. Silva, being represented by my good friend, Lamide. The Executive Secretary of uh, PPDF also represented. The Director of DPR, my good friend, Awalu, he made a very powerful presentation. The Chairman of SPE, Council of Nigeria, Mr. Latunji, Akuyumi, and the members present here, and of course those joining us virtually. Uh, my good friend being represented, that's the MD of Shell and Chairman of Shell, being represented by my own good friend, Sam. And of course, uh, the MD of Atiu, I think uh, he was seated here, uh, the CEOs and MDs of industries, particularly the IOCs and uh, indigenous oil and gas companies, captains of industry, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure and honor to be invited as a key speaker on this well-chosen topic, operational excellence and portfolio optimization way forward for the oil and gas industry post-COVID-19. I am particularly impressed with the awareness of current trends within the oil and gas industry due to the unprecedented global pandemic. This topic is profoundly pertinent as it addresses the growing concerns in the oil and gas industry, which has for many decades remained the critical engine for national economic growth. The annual Olobri Lecture Series and Energy Forum, which is focused on contributing to the development of the oil and gas policies for Nigeria, was instituted in commemoration of the first oil well drilled in Nigeria by the Shell Gassi at Olobri in Ogbaya Bayasa State. This forum was consistently and successfully organized for over 29 years, except for 2020 due to the global COVID-19 pandemic. Petroleum prospecting started in the Southwest of Nigeria in 1908. This resulted to the first commercial oil found by Shell at Olebri in the Niger Delta area by 1956. With a modest production of about 5,100 barrels per day from Olebri, Shell was at that time granted the sole concessionary rights covering the whole territory of Nigeria. The success of Shell in the Niger Delta attracted other IOCs to Nigeria. And in 1961, companies such as Mobil, Ajip, Desert, then called Teneco, Chevron, formerly called Gulf, and Elf, which was at that time called Safrap, began exploration for the oil in the onshore and offshore areas of the Niger Delta. Over the years, the major IOCs as operators continue to dominate the oil and gas sphere in the country. By 2010, the IOCs actively as operators accounted for about 95% of the nation's production. However, between 2010 and 2015, the IOCs took significant strides through the deliberate local content policies and divestments. This era witnessed the transfer of acreages to indigenous oil and gas companies and subsequently they were all appointed as operators of these different assets. The growth in the industry led to an escalation of the oil operating cost drivers, most of them namely human resources, logistics, security, direct lifting, and operational maintenance. These cost drivers became a major source of concern to all stakeholders. Although some of the reasons for the rise are attributable to global economic factors, a significant part of this is due to operational factors. The oil and gas industry was at that time facing different challenges even before the COVID-19 pandemic started. However, this pandemic affected the global economy by disrupting crude oil production, demand, supply chain, and of course, financial markets. 
The long-term effects of such undesirable trends further increased costs, reduced revenues, and resulted in new risk management challenges for both the operators and the concessionaires. Consequently, these setbacks of the industry compelled oil and gas companies to either suspend or reduce costs on their operations. Currently, operations worldwide started developing strategies to address the rising operating costs. These strategies were adopted in the face of shrinking profit margins to significantly reduce costs and institutionalize efficiency at all levels of operations. The pandemic expedited the industry's ability to develop certain survival strategies originally considered to be unattainable. The challenges also posed by the energy transition in the industry require the upstream companies to make a very bold choice. The industry was forced to curtail spending as it grappled with the challenges of sustaining current production levels, drilling operations, funding future growth, and maintaining positive cash flow. There have been also declining investments in the oil and gas exploration, which will further affect the growth in the market. In view of the prevailing circumstances, a quick intervention strategy was adopted across the industry. One, to reduce the unit operating costs through deliberate efforts, notably renegotiating all ongoing contracts, deferment of capital spend, and of course, process optimization, which was elaborately uh, discussed by the director of DPI. Furthermore, the upstream oil and gas sector quickly adopted the global business trend of digital transformation through the conduct of virtual meetings and trainings going to the new norm. And as you can see today, because of the COVID-19 um, protocols, we have about only 50 persons in this hall while all others are virtually joining us. I think that's a huge uh, way of also reducing costs and minimizing risk. And this, as a means, was to increase profitability. Amid this requirement to become more efficient, there are emerging concerns on the importance of fossil fuel against the backdrop of transiting to a cleaner energy sources. Please note that the gas resources of coming from these energy still remains a major component of fossil fuel. However, it is being projected that fossil fuels who still make up a substantial percentage of the global energy mix in the coming decades, especially in developing countries like Nigeria. Companies must identify ways to diversify their portfolio by investing across new business, emerging frontiers, renewables, research, and technology to become more efficient and relevant. In Nigeria particularly, the focus has been on increasing oil production growing domestic gas utilization, and maturing hydrocarbon reserves to generate revenue for the nation. However, at this moment, we are being curtailed by the OPEC court. So we in NNPC are also determined to increase the downstream market share to guarantee energy security, investment in petrochemicals and fertilizer plants, promote the use of CNG and LPG, which is compressed natural gas, and liquefied petroleum gas as auto fuels and increase the domestic refining capacity. As you all know, yesterday, FERC approved $1.5 million billion for the rehabilitation of the Kotako refinery. In the attainment of these target objectives, NMPC as a group has repositioned its business architecture towards transiting to an energy company. As part of this evolution process, NMPC is embarking on an aggressive drive to monetize its gas reserves, thereby increasing revenue and power generation. This will offer the opportunity for the corporation to also stimulate its interest in cleaner energy investment, as well as the expansion of its non-oil and gas portfolio, namely renewables, healthcare, research, technology, and of course, innovation, telecommunications, and real estate value. To buttress this, we've created a division called the Research and Technology Innovation Division for us to drive this process. We also have what we call the Renewable Energy Division 
as part of our own energy mix drive. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, let me state that it has become imperative to structure what we call a fit for the future portfolio, which shields companies from probable price downsides, ensures sustained performance in a low crude oil price regime, and scale up very rapidly when prices move higher. In today's business environment, the focus is on process efficiency, cost reduction, and portfolio optimization. This criteria has become very key in positioning the industry for the future. On behalf of the Group Managing Director of NPC, I wish you all a fruitful deliberation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Engineer Tomomie, who represented the GMD of the NMPC. Can we please give him another round of applause? Thank you, sir. Okay. So we're moving on, moving on now to our next speaker, delivering to us a goodwill and a state of the industry address. I told you shortly um, earlier that he joined us virtually via Zoom, but had to move on to other meetings, but has sent in his chief of staff to present, to present him. Speak of His Excellency Chief Timmy Perez Silva, Honorable Minister of State, Petroleum Resources. Let's now welcome Engineer Moses Olamide as he speaks on behalf of the Honorable Minister. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what people have said, I'm here representing the minister who was uh, with us earlier this morning by Zoom. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> as we stand it for him, so I'm going to deliver a speech as it was sent to me. Therefore, to deliver this speech, I'm going to stand on the existing protocol. I am pleased to deliver the goodwill message at the State of the Industry Address on this occasion of the 2021 Uluberi Lecture Series and Energy Forum OLEC, of this great society themed operational excellence and portfolio optimization. Way forward for the oil and gas industry post COVID-19. This year's series is a unique one, marks the third decade of its existence, and falls within various activities changing the dynamics of the industry. The discovery of crude oil in commercial quantity at Olegri Ogbea local government area of present day Baesa State in 1956 marked a turning point in the history of hydrocarbon resource mining has brought significant fortunes in Nigeria and Nigerians alike. I am therefore proud to say that the inauguration of the annual Library Lecture Series and Energy Forum OLED in June 1991 is the best legacy ever bequeathed on the oil and gas industry in Nigeria. As I have expressed at several fora, the Federal Council of Society of Petroleum Engineers remains a major part of the development fabric of our great country. All the professional men and women who continue to make significant contributions to the progress and sustainability of the oil and gas industry in Nigeria. For this, we continue to express our admiration and profound gratitude to this very distinguished society.
is also commendable that despite the COVID-19 pandemic challenges which affected this event last year, we have forged ahead in planning and hosting a live and virtual only event in 2021. COVID-19 pandemic has also broadened the need for operational excellence the oil and gas industry brings for the purpose of this occasion to be viewed as a mindset that embraces certain strategy to create sustainability improvement in the industry with cognizance to the global pandemic crisis, unstable food oil prices, and the race for energy transition to renewables. Over the years, this mindset has evolved industry-wide, Society of Petroleum Engineers being in the forefront. Furthermore, the result of our gathering today and view, view petroleum optimization as the process of selecting the best assets out of numerous available. This uncertain objective that guarantee cost effectiveness and maximum expected returns for investors and appropriate take for government. In the recent years, global commodity prices, particularly crude oil and gas, were moving downwards. This downward trend was aggravated by the entrance of the global pandemic COVID-19 in December 2019. This permitted every sector of human existence and economy with the resultant negative impact on the Nigerian oil and gas industry, invoking a critical need to re recalibrate portfolio and operations in the upstream, midstream, and downstream of the sector. On assumption of office, the government of President Mohammed Buhari recognized the significance of the oil and gas industry as an enabler of national growth and development. The Ministry of Petroleum Resources, therefore, carved out some strategic priorities sector in order to foster the sustainability of the Nigerian economy, create well-paid jobs, and take millions of Nigerians out of poverty. In this regard, all stakeholders were brought on board to fashion out cost reduction strategy in the offshore sector through contract renegotiations, reduction of contracting cycle time, sharing of common facilities, containment of personnel logistics, review of crude handling contracts, and installation of lease automatic custody transfer units, synergy in security, and the de uh, deployment of evolving technology on site. The government is equally considering the granting of regulatory forbearance to banks to restructure terms of facilities to oil and gas investors that are currently facing debt servicing challenges due to COVID-19 pandemic. In the downstream sector, market-driven price of PMS is being considered to complete the full deregulation of white products in Nigeria. The gas sector inaugurated the National Gas Expansion Program Committee, NGEP, in January 2020. To spearhead the adoption and use of natural gas products like LPG, CNG, and LNG to fuel all prime movers, particularly auto, across the northern breadth of Nigeria as an alternative to carbon heavy products like PMS and EU. We also achieve go life of the national gas transportation network pool, which is necessary to stimulate the multiplier effect of gas in the domestic economy, position Nigeria competitively in high-value export markets, and guarantee long-term energy security. In the area of resource, we implore you and your society to please support. We are all aware that the PIB is now before the National Assembly 
and when passed into law, it not only guarantee a robust option fiscal framework beneficial to both government and investors, but we also unlock several missing gas opportunities to further enhance domestic gas utilization. With this framework, based on core principles of clarity, dynamism, neutrality, open access, and fiscal rules of general application. The number of opportunities are bound for members of the society, particularly SP, after the passage of the bill. Ladies and gentlemen, I advise you to reposition yourselves for the implementation of the upcoming industry act. In conclusion, there's no denying the fact that COVID-19 has had impact on the global economy. Its negative effects on the unprecedented decline in crude oil prices in 2020 have made it imperative for Nigeria to initiate strategic survival measures to ensure economic sustainability and job security. Remember, as an industry, we have survived several hard times. Therefore, it is not strange now to undertake a strategic switch and future proof operational excellence in the Nigeria and oil and gas industry. Let me assure you that the FG is ready, willing, and able to play its part, and we call on all hands to be on them. I congratulate the leadership of Nigeria Council or the Society of Petroleum Engineers for organizing this timely event and wish you successful deliberation of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Engineer Moses Olamide, Chief of Staff to the Honorable Minister of the Petroleum Resources, working us through the minister's address and goodwill. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I thought I was listening to the minister himself. The voice sounded quite familiar. I'm mean, a similar rather. <laughs> Thank you very much for representing your uh, principal very appropriately. Thank you so much. Can you please give him another round of applause? Okay, so before we get to the lecture itself that will be taken by Shell, I have two short videos to share with you. The first one is a three minute video from our host, the PTDF. Following that will be an approximately 10 minutes video on the history of Oloibri. To save time, I'm going to take them back to back. So the three minutes video will first from the host, and then there will be a lot of movies I have gone out about Oloibri, but SPE being one society, that has championed the legacy of Oloibri with this lecture, 30 years and counting now, in, the, in that 10 minutes, will attempt to summarize the history of that very first oil well in Nigeria as drilled by Shell back in the day. But before we get into that, I want to recognize the presence of the Chairman National Gas Expansion Program, who is in the hall with us, Dr. M. M. Ibrahim. Dr. Ibrahim, good morning, sir, and welcome. I'm told that the principal of PTI is also online. Prof, we welcome you. Thank you for being with us. Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Now, please keep your eyes on the screens and we'll go with the first three minutes video from our host. The Petroleum Technology Development Fund welcomes all delegates, participants, speakers, and special guests to this oil and gas industry event. As a lead agency of government for human and institutional capacity development for the oil and gas industry, PTDF strives to bring together relevant stakeholders, industry experts, associations, and intellectuals to ventilate ideas and conduct cerebral discussions on the present and future dynamics of the oil and gas industry in a most conducive environment. As the one-stop center for oil and gas events, 
PTDF is building consensus on the imperatives of the sector and evolving as the intellectual backbone of the industry for solving critical problems of the sector. PTDF committed to increasing local capacity in the oil and gas industry through human capital development, institutional capacity building, and research for technology development. My name is Bilami Ismail Ali. I'm from Kassina State. I was trained under the PTDF WTCP welding, welding and certification program. Uh, currently, I work with Niger Dog Snake Island, uh, Snake Island Free Zone Enterprise. I'm a 6GR welder. I want to appreciate the effort of the federal government in training, our, in training us. I'm in the oil industry, courtesy of the trade in LLM Petroleum Law, sponsored by PTDF. PTDF has done a great job, personally impacting not just my life, but the life of a lot of young men. I, in particular, can testify, not just in doing a good job, but doing it fairly to all. I got a scholarship without knowing anybody in PTDF, without influencing anything. The first day I was called and informed by a friend, I actually missed my name twice because I, don't, I didn't believe that it's possible to get something on merits without influencing anything in this country. So they restored the faith in this country and they've continued to do it. PTDF gave us 259,000 naira. It was over half a million dollars then. We used the money to equip our department in University of Lagos on research. And that is the reason why we have been able to produce many PhDs. I thought this PhD six are professors today. If you can see the impact of the research from PTDL, what it has been to us, University of Lagos. PTDL is doing well, and I must tell you, it's one of the government organizations that I will give distinctions to any day. Get it? They are doing well. Oloibiri oil field is named after Oloibiri, a small remote creek community where it is located. It is an onshore oil field located in Oloibiri in Obia, local government area of Bayasa State, about 13.75 square kilometers and lies in the swamp within OML 29. After 50 years of unsuccessful oil exploration in Nigeria, the Discovery Well, Oloibiri 1, was spotted on 3rd August 1955 by Shell Dassey and drilled to a total vertical depth of 12,008 feet into the tertiary at that formation. It was tested to rate of about 5,000 barrels of oil per day, making the first commercial discovery in Nigeria and West Africa on Sunday, 15th January 1956. After a 20 year period, the Oloibiri oil field produced over 20 million barrels of oil, and the field was abandoned in 1978 when production ceased. This discovery launched Nigeria into the League of Petro States. Nigeria became the largest oil and gas producer in Africa and joined Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, in 1971. The era of predictable oil prices ended post-1960s. Besides fluctuating oil price, a problem affecting the petroleum industry is rapidly changing away from the traditional exploration, production and sales of petroleum products due to the need for cleaner energy. 
There is a need for more robust planning strategies, including portfolio optimization. Such future-oriented strategic business development will be based on the identified general drivers, societal trends, potential future demand profiles, threats, and opportunities outlook. The history behind Oloi Biri 1 gave rise in 1991 to the first Oloibri Lecture Series and Energy Forum, OLEF. And this year marks 30 years since its inception. OLEF, an annual lecture series, continues to focus on contributing to the oil and gas policies development in Nigeria by creating a platform on an annual basis where the government, regulatory agencies, and heads of industry practitioners at all levels, as well as other key stakeholders from around Africa, meet to discuss improvement opportunities in the Nigerian oil and gas industry. This year's theme, Professional Excellence and Portfolio Optimization, Way Forward for the Oil and Gas Industry Post-COVID-19. It is poised to challenge our industry in various ways. by so doing in doing that it is obvious they would have learned some lessons overcame some challenges and indeed know where all the bodies are buried little wonder spe selected the chairman country shell companies in nigeria to talk to us in this year's lecture on the theme or the topic operational excellence and portfolio optimization strategic imperatives gains and challenges as we all know He's not here with us, Mr. Sagi Okubo, but representing him ably is the man in charge of development at Shell. Let's welcome Mr. Sam Izuguri. The Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum, our GMD every represented here, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please uh, permit me to stand on the greeting protocol and uh, attempt to deliver, to deliver this lecture on behalf of, on behalf of my own. The gentleman <laughs> whose shoes to put my leg in. But having called upon to deliver this lecture, I will indeed try and do my best. Let me start by saying that the past 12 months have been very historic in the whole world. The world that we live in has changed. Our lives also have changed. Little did we know that working from home would become the new normal. And that in itself translated laptops to real laptops. Because we have very clearly blended away work and life, meaning they now mean the same thing. We can now work off our bedrooms of our dining tables, in our living rooms, with laptops on our laps. Never did we know that summer holidays will turn into staycation. Alec Musa and I actually flew down here last year, attempting to come for the Olaf lecture series. We were in the hotel in the night, 
when it dawned on us that our world has changed. And the OLEF 2020 was cancelled. The whole world went into some level of lockdown, either partial or total, and all in response to COVID-19 pandemic, which as at the last, maybe mid-March, has actually afflicted over 117 million people worldwide with about 2.6 million deaths. So ladies and gentlemen, this will tell you that this is a very unprecedented times that we are in. And if that was not bad enough, the world began to respond to it. The energy demand began to weigh down because of the lockdown. So I would like to actually start by, first of all, saying that my hearts and prayers are with those that have lost their lives in the course of the pandemic. And then also prayers with those still battling with the pandemic. Now, it is also my sincere thanks to the organizers of OLEF. Having quickly learned and recovered from the challenges that we had last year and brought us to this hybrid event. And if I go straight into the real topic of the day, which is what we have learned and how we are then going to run our operations in an excellent manner through portfolio optimization, the way forward for oil and gas industry in Nigeria, our challenges and path forward. I would then say that it is a very important subject and this is indeed a very time, is a very apt time for us to begin to think of how to build a very bright and sustainable future, especially for the oil and gas industry in the country. The coronavirus pandemic has scared the whole global economy, leaving it below the pre-pandemic trajectory by about 4.5%. The global energy demand has also no died due to partial or total lockdown across the various economies, culminating in low oil prices for all the energy products. The result, therefore, is a massive decline in gross earnings for all the various industries across, and then also in particular for the oil and gas industry, in such a way and manner that, as my friend Adoti said, survivor now became the real buzzword and the real norm for the oil and gas industry rather than profitability. Where we are today, the global economy is now adapting to restrictions and controls. And then we are seeing the rapid in, in, uh, introduction of vaccines. The monetary and physical in, uh, interventions also coming from the government and central banks and then development financial, financial institutions. So if you look forward again, what we see is a potential increase in global energy demand in the current year by about 5.5%, and then another 4.1% in 2022. This is coming from the decrease that we saw in 2020 of about 3.5%. However, even with that growth in view, there is still significant uncertainty that we see in the energy industry due to the demand outlook. It is therefore imperative that for energy players like ourselves, we continually we strategize and reinvigorate and transform on how to stay financially competitive in the light of the dynamic and uncertain world that we live in today. So the combination of COVID-19, low oil price, energy transition, and OPEC courts have led to massive drop in earnings in 2020. Some companies saw up to 200% drop in their earnings. We have also seen some reaction in capital allocation and capital uh, 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 application to uh, capital projects. Globally, we have seen about $35 billion cut across the oil majors. We have also seen some projected divestment initiatives across the IOCs with an aim to improve cash flow competitiveness and efficiency. The other element that have also seen and taken a very big impact is our operating cost. 
where we have seen globally between 5 and 10 percent reductions in operating costs across the industry. And we have seen this through various actions such as staff cut, bonus cut, and dividend cuts. So reorganization and structural changes are also taking place in, you know, in many countries, in companies across. Then if you come back to Nigeria, our industry as expected was not immune from all these impacts. And the average cost of production again in Nigeria uh, at about two, uh, in, in 2016 covered around $28 per barrel of oil, which is one of the highest when you look globally, with UK leading the, 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 the team around $44 per barrel, Brazil at 35. This is very high and unsustainable. And this will then bring us to the address of our own GMB in June 2020, where he set a target of $10 per barrel for you know, production. This will bring us to our next competitors, the best in class in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, where they are, their own cost of production is around $10 per barrel. And to actualize this, we have to do things differently. So since this is the start of the pandemic, the operational excellence and portfolio optimization opportunities have become more critical for us, not just to become profitable, but to survive in the short term. And I would just like to dwell a little bit more on why this becomes very imperative. If you look at operational excellence in broader sense, there are several reasons why they have to be our next norm. Because particularly, you will see we will gain some reason, reasonable measure in reduced cost and increased revenue for all the oil industries. There is also the element of operational, uh, uh, operational excellence in reduced HSE exposures, reduce or eliminate waste completely. And at the heart of that is actually engaged and stable workforce. So for us to be able to achieve portfolio optimization, some strategic imperatives need to be and get into the because we then need to look at our environmental factors and energy trends. The high margin of our operations will have to be replaced by low cost of operations. We will then need to look at our physical considerations. And if I also listen to our uh, director of DPR, the physical considerations is something that is also at the tip of being actualized for us in Nigeria through the PIB. And having a favorable PIB is also foundational and key to achieving operational excellence. There will be some elements of portfolio diversification, choices and rationalization that will happen in the course of the time. Because as we continue to see challenges with capital allocation, we will then also see some portfolio choices and diversification. And this is also being orchestrated by the energy transition and quest for low carbon uh, and a more friendly environmental uh, energy. So if you look at operational excellence in action, I would like to just reference the Business Transformation and Operational Excellence World Summit that carried out a research across 86 industry sections all over the world. It might be interesting to see that on the top eight leading companies in operational excellence across the world, not even one of them is in the oil and gas sector. So again, it calls for every one of us, either in the room here or virtually, and across the world actually to pause and just begin to reflect. If you are not in the top eight, are you in the game at all? I think we are not in the game, we haven't started. So we are on the sideline watching and clapping for the likes of Amazon, for the likes of Toyota, Google, Apple. And these companies are really, if you look at their own balance sheet, you will begin to reflect that you may go into extinct very shortly, or the investors may not be able to put money in our business anymore. They would rather go to the 
cloud computing or something else. So again, underscores the importance of what we're talking about today, that we really need to have a deep reflection on how we then need to begin to do things differently. And if you ask me, what then do we need to think about? We then need to begin to benchmark ourselves against these other parts of the industries. We have to shift from looking at ourselves as being oil and gas, and we are special, because we are no longer special. We need to think and reflect that the whole world and businessmen and women all over the world would like to put their money where they would get the best reward. And investors will begin and rather choose to invest in these other areas than in the oil and gas industry. So a serious case for action for every one of us who is either connected virtually or who is in the room, but is a key player in the oil and gas industry. And that means that if I just fast forward, the first and the visible thing that we then need to do is a leadership action, call for action. Every leader in the industry would then need to challenge him or herself to a point where we then begin to just reject our current position and say that we need to do things differently. We need to move away from the manual time consuming processes that we have and go digital. And making sure that we have a, re a resilient organization is also very, very important. So for every one of us who is a leader in the industry, you then need to just think about two basic things. This capital allocation and this human allocation. If you get the right person on the right job and you invest in the right environment, then we will be able to transform our business. So what am I saying in essence? There is a need for organizational cultural shift from just doing what we are used to doing in the past, thinking that what got us to point A is sufficient to get us to point B. The world has taught us a lesson, either from the COVID, from the low oil price, from all the responses that the whole world and the world economy has put in place, that indeed what we have done is insufficient. And if you also recover and recognize the fact that we then need to really begin to think about our gap to potential. So in essence, again, I would like to reiterate that the governance and processes that we have in place needs to be slimmer, leaner, and agile. And I give a classical example. Every one of us in this industry, the process time that we put a contract in place is just too long. And that in itself, Again, from the part of the world that I come from, time is money. If you spend six months, one year, two years to put a major contract in place, your economy for your project would have changed after you have your contract in place. So it is very important that our processes and our procedures will need to be agile to be able to respond to the new normal. We also then need to do a lot with our employees. Human capital development is very crucial. If you have the right person on the right role, then you would expect that everyone is pulling in the same direction. So employee engagement, empowerment, especially people in the front line becomes very crucial because for you as a leader, there might be a huge chasm between what you think and what the reality is actually in the place where business and work is done. And if somebody comes back to you and tells you that he has done something in half the time that is required to do it, please spend some time and ask and understand how that was done. Because you may have caught corners. And our industry is an industry of risk where safety, and one safety incident can actually wipe everything that you have done out. We are living example of some, we are living witnesses to some examples across the globe. And the last but not the least is our ability to also deploy digital and technology solutions. 
Now, if you talk about technology, you need to split technology into two. There will be new technology that will help you to break new grounds. There will be existing technologies that will help you to achieve your main objective either safer, faster, or cheaper. And then you begin to see how you can leverage technology in achieving operational excellence and optimization. Those are some of the key things that I believe if we do, we will shift our bottom line impact by reducing operating costs, increasing efficiencies and productivity, and also making sure that we achieve the right human and material mental health that is also required in the current climate. Because again, if you look at working from home, I don't know how it is with you. I don't know when it's going to end, but my family are now used to myself telling them, when they pass by. So again, interesting times. But I, I think that it is also time that we also have to learn very fast because the challenge that we have, which is the COVID-19 pandemic is novel and it also requires a novel solution. So the one that learns fastest will come out of the curve first. So how you open your mind to learn becomes also very imperative in the current times. So if I look at the key elements that we need to then begin to adapt to drive operational excellence, um, a popular quote from uh, Pricewaterhouse says that the operational excellence is the foundation for organizational transformation that unlocks full business value by understanding what customers want and driving internal efficiencies to meet those expectations. Those expectations are referring to customer wants. And I tell you, for us to begin to really make the real mark, we need to shift from customer satisfaction to customer loyalty. And somebody then may ask me, Sam, what do you mean by customer loyalty? We all use phones. And I just use a hypothetical example. I want to buy Nokia N90, for instance. That's not the latest Nokia, by the way. And then I go into the dealership shop and I will ask, please, do you have Nokia N90? They say, no, uh, Sam, why are you looking for Nokia N90? And I give my reason, say, no. There is this latest one that the pictures, you know, the, you know, the pixels are so, so nice, and the picture clarity is this and that, that, that. After all the manifesto, I said, please, do you have Nokia N90? And he says, no, I put my money in my pocket and I go home. Maybe he was trying to market Samsung or Apple or whatever. Maybe that is far from us. Then something that is all of us here, also most people across the globe follow today is maybe if you are a fan of one football club or the other. Some of us lose appetite when your club lose, you know, lose a game. But some of us are just either mouse pad holders of the club that you love, or you wear the jersey with your name at the back, and so on and so forth. You are still within customer satisfaction. Yeah. The day Magnus becomes a true Arsenal fan is the day I see an Arsenal tattoo on his skin. That day, whether Arsenal has lost 8-0 to Liverpool or Man U, even if he uses laser to remove the tattoo, the imprint will still be there. So that is customer loyalty. You can then bring that back into our business. What will make someone, either an investor, who is looking at you, choose you over and above the next investment destination? is your ability to satisfy the customer needs and the customer expectations. And again, why investors put their money in any business is that they make good returns in a safe and profitable manner. Safe, because if the risks are very high, um, the investor may think twice before they also put their money down. So again, I will say that the first key thing there that we need to look at is our effectiveness in our asset management systems. How we show leadership commitment, 
how we make sure that our processes are lean, smooth, and and, um, and, and and agile. And then our own organizational capability, very critical. How do we learn? We need to dig in to the root causes of the operational issues and challenges that we have. Because again, if you go back to the traditional way, if you fall and get up in a hurry, there is a high tendency that you fall again. So when you fall, please watch your environment before you get up, or you might have to get up on your fallings. We need to identify and eliminate wastes. Our industry is challenged by wastes. We need to be thinking more end to end. We need to really imbibe lean processes. And for us to be able to do this, we need to empower our organization. An empowered organization, an engaged organization is a high performing organization. We need to also, in this modern era, be a data driven organizational uh, uh, element. The insights of data and analytics have become very critical for us to be able to make fast decisions. We need to monitor and measure and monitor our performance because what you cannot measure, you will never be able to improve. It. So I will just spend a few minutes and then give you a few cases, learnings that we have actually done differently in Shell in the last one year, two years, where we have also learned either working under the pandemic, working from home, uh, seeing some measure of improvement in alignment with our own GMD's aspiration towards a $10 per barrel oil production cost. We had one of our low pressure night compressor systems that we had to improve a great deal. We unlocked about $5 million of free cash flow and achieved about 95% availability in an old compressor system. And you can ask yourself, what changed? We changed our operating philosophy. We began to count and monitor trips. How many trips in a day, if at all, if any, in a week, in a month? And then we begin to deepen the conversation into why are the systems tripping? The root cause analysis. So we spend time in understanding why. We shifted from who was on duty, who was on call, to really deepening our understanding of what had gone wrong. There was frontline ownership and accountability, and we ensured that we trained our technicians. If I also then fast forward, one of our assets over the period of three years through operational excellence and optimization, we doubled the production from the asset without a single new well, not a walkover, and through WRFM interventions. So overall, what we are talking about here in the room is doable. It only takes some kind of concerted efforts and commitment from every one of us, and we will achieve our destination. So I've told told that I have five minutes, so I then need to fast forward um, my presentation to how we can then build a sustainable portfolio optimization and what are the key elements. We've talked and listened to various speeches today, and one of the key takeaways is our ability to diversify. Diversify and diversification is coming in because, and then it's topmost because of our movement to cleaner energy. We then need to challenge ourselves in a way and manner that we need to do things differently, even with our portfolio. We need to be competitive 
and we need to be resilient. And if you ask me on what expect specifically the women need to do going forward, I think they come under about five umbrellas. The first is what I call a tripartite partnership. There is need for partnership between the government, the industry, and the academia. This is one of the key enablers for us to be able to achieve a sustained and a more resilient, efficient oil and gas industry in Nigeria. We also then need to focus a lot more on our human capital development. Competence development becomes very key because we need to have the right people on the right seat doing the right things. We need to embrace digital transformation. I've spoken a lot about this. Then local technology deployment is also something that is very, very key. We have several smart and proof, safe proof that local technologies that have actually helped us also to maintain heightened production. There is one element that we deploy, deployed in Shell that is an intruder detection system around our wellheads, which have actually helped us to minimize uh, intruder interfer interference and people who would like to vandalize our wellheads. That has also improved ex ex extensively our availability and production performance over the last years. There is also a great call at this point for environmental and social governance. Because we are all living in a global world where we are now being challenged to go to cleaner energy, I will then challenge every one of us in the room here and then in this industry that we need to move very fast in embracing the global direction and the global challenge. Because again, if you bring it back home to our local setting, you might think that, oh, the cleaner energy is something that happens in the other parts of the world, and then we are not there yet. First of all, the environmental impact of our gas flaring is very huge. And then even if you look, take that away and come to our people who are living in rural areas, most of them are in darkness. So we then need to take power to them. But most significantly as well, even for all of us who are in the room here, you might think that you have a vehicle. But the day if, if, if the car manufacturers shift from manufacturing fossil fuel-based vehicles to electric cars completely, then you will have to make do with Dokumbo for a longer period. And woe to you if you run out of spare parts because the spare parts will not exist then you'll be in trouble. And the people that manufacture generators will also cease to manufacture those. So all of us will be in darkness in no time if we do not do something very fast to respond to the global direction in terms of cleaner energy. So in conclusion, therefore, I would just like to say that we have seen some significant improvement in our operations in the last 12 months and embedding operational excellence and portfolio optimization as a way of life is highly recommended because that is in line with the global direction. That is also in line with our national oil company direction. That is in line with our government aspiration. And for us to be able to do this, we need to build a very competitive and resilient oil and gas industry that is also anchored on data-driven decision-making processes to improve our unit production costs in this. And then we also then have to build strategic partnership across the academia, the government, and the industry. And finally, and finally, I would like to reemphasize that for us to achieve all this also in a very uh, inclusive manner, we need to have a very conducive petroleum industry bill that will enable the investment of global fund in our country. On that note, I would like to thank you very much for listening and um, have a great day. So if you were wondering
and how companies like Shell did business during the lockdown. Now you have some bit of insight, learned from their lessons, I suppose. And you know what to do moving forward. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, we will just, we've tweaked our program just a little, a little bit. And that is to say, we're going to go into the part three. After the part three, we will take the wrap up from um, Mr. Okoronkwo. And after that, a vote of thanks from the Vice Council Chair, then lunch will be served. That's just the little tweak that we have done to the program. But before I get into the part three, uh, by the way, if you have a question online, please locate the Q&A box on Zoom and type in your questions there, telling us, of course, where you're uh, uh, asking from, affiliation, that is. In the room here, if you have a question, please write it on a piece of paper and pass it to the ushers. They'll bring it to me. The ushers have a piece of paper. If you don't have one, they will assist you. Thank you. Before I get into part three, it is recommended that you don't sit for too long at a stretch. So please, wherever you are, rise to your feet and let's just stretch a bit. Let's just stretch a bit. Let's just stretch a bit before getting to the... would be leaving us. You presented the GMD. Can we please give me one more round of applause? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We appreciate um, your insights. Okay. So let's just stretch. Don't just stand. Stretch your legs. Stretch your hands, you know, so that uh, once we sit down again, it will increase assimilation of what we're heading to right now. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you very much. We can be seated. We can be seated. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, those of you online, I hope you stood up. I hope you did some stretch. I hope you did some stretch. Um, it is all for our own health benefit. I hope you did some stretch as well. Thank you all very much. Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. In the part three, it is going to work out like this. We have our panel members who will speak individually, and then we'll have our moderator who will kickstart the speeches. At the end of all the um, speeches from the panelists, he will then come back. Of course, he will be the one assigning them to speak. Now, once he's done with that, he will then come and take Q&A. After that, he will pass it, us back to, he will pass it back to us here in the room, and we will take the wrap up from um, one of our uh, panel panelists for today, his own duties during the wrap up, and thereafter, we'll do the vote of thanks, and that will be it. So let's get straight into the energy forum proper. This is now the panel conversations, okay? I will just quickly do a short, short, short introduction of our panel members and then pass it on to the moderator. Let me begin just a short introduction of um, our panel members. Let me begin with um, all the way from Asia, the Chief Technology Officer, Huawei Energy, Department HQ. Um, he, 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 ha he has a deep knowledge of petroleum exploration, fuel development, and digital oil fuel and rich problem solving work experience from over 30 countries across the globe. Uh, he was a former Schlumberger Consulting Services General Manager for Asia Pacific, Mr. Wang Hao. Mr. Wang Hao is joining us online. We welcome him. Now, we also have don't, don't worry when it's time for them to speak. When Chike calls them, you can do this. I'm just, you know, introducing them with their sh short bio. Our next panelist is, is um, the Executive Director and Chief Financial Officer, Total EMP Nigeria Limited. Before her appointment as EDCFO, as she was the Financial Controller of Total EMP Nigeria Limited, Managing Director, Total EMP Nigeria 
closed pension fund, finance and administrative director, Total EMP South Africa, general manager finance and control, Deepwater District of Total EMP Nigeria, a financial controller, continental Europe and Central Asia at Total's headquarters in France, and general manager control, Total EMP Nigeria Limited. So we have Mrs. Tai Oshi Sonya. Mrs. Oshi Sonya is also on the panel. All of them will be brought up individually by Mr. Wonsu, our moderator, when it's time for them to speak. Our next panelist is the general manager, JV Operations, for the National Petroleum Investment Management Services. She was appointed to the position. Uh, she was appointed to the position uh, um, GM JV Oil Operations in Nappings in, Mar in March of 2020, where she currently oversees the operations of several joint venture companies, ensuring that the Federation extracts maximum value from its upstream oil and gas assets. And of course, the chief executive, uh, I'm, oh, I beg your pardon, I'm talking about in this regard, the GM engineer Martina Atucci, engineer Mrs. Martina Atucci is also joining us online. And then the chief executive officer um, and executive director of Supply Petroleum, chief executive officer and MD, I guess this should be clear, MD of Supply Petroleum Development Company PLC, Mr. Roger Thompson is represented by OK Mba. OK Mba, as I told you earlier, is the MD of one of Supply's subsidiaries. And of course, the executive secretary of PTDF is also on the panel, and that will be Dr. Belo Aliou Buzo, who is represented by Mr. Jide Adebulein. And of course, our moderator, whom I'll be passing it on to. Before that, the wrap up will be done by the managing director, ITO ENP Limited, who is in the room and on the uh, uh, panel table with us, uh, Mr. Victor Okoronko, who has over 30 years of oil and gas experience, bringing that rich experience from Shell into ITO as ITO's current MD. And our moderator needs really no introduction to those of us in the SBE. Uh, he's an experienced senior executive with 30 years local and international experience in the oil and gas industry with demonstrated expertise in management of upstream oil and gas projects, new business development, divestments and acquisitions, midstream gas and downstream refining, refining. And then he delivered Nigeria's first modular refinery amidst the COVID-19 pandemic in October of 2020. I speak of the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, Walter Smith Petroman Oil Limited, Mr. Chikizie Mosu, who is also a former council chairman. So Mr. Mosu will walk us through this session. Uh, once he's done with his panel members, he will then call for questions, and I've told you how we'll address um, the questions. Mr. Mosu, sir, if you can hear me, it is all yours from this point. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my good friend, uh, Richmond. I'm assuming everybody can hear me very well. Yes, I can hear you now, sir, loud and clear. Thank you. Um, I will stand on existing protocols, but we'll have to uh, recognize the representative of the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Chief Timipri Silva. Uh, I would also uh, like to uh, recognize the uh, representative of uh, the GMD NMPC, uh, my good friend, Advocate. Uh, and also the uh, director CEO of the DPR, um, engineer Sarki Awalu. You're all very welcome. Uh, all the other SPE, uh, ARD, BOT chairman, SPE Nigerian Council uh, president, or oh, sorry, chairman, and uh, all the other section chair people, you're all very welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We'll try and uh, make this as efficient as possible. So I will just go through a quick review of the notes that I have captured from the various uh, speakers, including the uh, lecturer. And um, uh, then I will go to the panelists to give a three minutes introduction of you know, their understanding of the topics around operational excellence and portfolio optimization, the way forward for the oil and gas industry post COVID-19. So I'll first start with um, the DPR director, CEO, Indira Sarkia Walu. He talked about operations excellence and um, he actually captured it as where value can flow to all stakeholders, government, industry, and the community at large. 
He did mention how DPR has focused on supporting the generation of revenue for government and had two trillion naira, which was anchored on operations excellence. He noted that DPR is very mindful of the growth of the industry and therefore are not playing a role just like at, you know, as simple as that of a regulator. They want to ensure that businesses are run profitably, cost efficiently, and environmentally friendly. To do that, DPR has streamlined their processes by leveraging on technology through data digitalization. He also mentioned the commissioning of the NOGET, the National Oil and Gas Excellence Center, which is an industry collaborative platform to focus on safety, cost optimization, and operations excellence. He then went further to state that the DPR has a mandate to be partners and value drivers. And whatever regulations they are putting in place are to help drive business value. And he ended with six cardinal points or imperatives that DPR is focused on. It's about HSE, which he said is non-negotiable, cost performance, standards and systems in process operations and business uh, operations excellence, continuous improvement culture, human capital development. And he wrapped it up by saying that of noted importance is the improved reputation that DPR is going to be reviewing the industry performance and providing feedback back in what he called a name and shape, but all with the purpose of driving operational excellence. The GMD NMPC, represented by engineer Dokie Tomogi, uh, talked about cost drivers, the major cost drivers that have been identified in the uh, EMP industry or oil and gas industry in Nigeria. And these cost drivers, not to be, is not an exhaustive list, include human resources cost, operations and maintenance, direct lifting, security, and logistics. And he says these higher costs lead to shrinking profit margins. And the industry has to be forced to curtail costs. And that has a direct impact on profit margins. He also touched about on the energy transition and mentioned that this will result in decline for, declining funding. And if it's already happened. And he mentioned emerging pressures on fossil fuels, but that why that is still going on, these fossil fuels, especially gas, will still make up a significant portion of energy mix. He then pushed and mentioned that NMPC is driving towards diversification. And that includes a few areas like domestic refining, petrochemicals, gas-based industry, LNG, LPG, CNG. He finally talked about imperatives, fit for future portfolio and some imperatives. Talked about process efficiency, cost reduction and portfolio optimization. This was then followed by the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, uh, represented by engineer Moses Olamide. And he touched quite a lot on all the uh, issues previously, but focused a little bit in his conclusion on the petroleum industry bill. I mentioned that this will pass soon and will have a significantly positive impact on the industry. He also mentioned the fact that it's a strategic imperative, the PIB, that will impact on cost profitability, government revenue, security, and community restiveness, and also a major impact on um, operations excellence. To wrap it up, the lecture was delivered on behalf of the uh, share companies in Nigeria country chair by my very good friend, um, Sam Ezuguri, and he gave a very wonderful um, uh, speech uh, and lecture. He talked about the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, and how it hit us, uh, lives lost, economies impacted. He mentioned about the oil demand going down by 3.5% in 2020, and um, that looking forward, the future does look bright. There is an estimated potential increase between 4 and 5% in oil demand in 2021 and 2022 but with still significant uncertainties. He then went ahead to mention some of the impacts. The earnings have dropped, OPEX, um, you know, OPEX needs to be reduced. And um, we talked about some other uh, areas around asset sales, 
reorganization and capex funding. And he mentioned overall, the cost of oil production in Nigeria is very high and it's circa $28 per barrel. And that there is a drive to reduce it to $10 per barrel. And that is a drive with both the NUCOPs and the initiatives being taken by the DPR. He talks, he talked about top reasons for operations excellence. And um, you know, operations excellence in practice as well. Improved efficiency and production, reducing cost and increasing revenues, enhancing shareholder value, reduced HSSC exposure and risk, and redu reduction of waste. He then went further to talk about the top reasons for portfolio optimization, including strategic priorities, setting strategic priorities, environmental factors, including things like the energy transition, which are out there facing us, um, higher margins if you can lower operations cost, fiscal considerations, and access to capital, portfolio diversification, which requires you to make certain choices and rationalize your portfolio. He then talked about operations excellence, the challenges, visibility, and leadership visibility, the lack of that thereof, um, trying to do things more automated instead of manual time consuming processes, overcoming the resistance to change. And then he talked about certain other areas around strategy. And he talked about the organizational culture, governance and, and process improvements, employee engagement and inclusion, digital and technology solutions that have to be put in place. And finally, he did mention the benefits of going through this whole um, you know, uh, process of operational excellence. The benefits include top and bottom line impact on the business, data-driven decision-making, engaged and efficient uh, uh, workforce. And uh, one of the key elements he kept emphasizing is effective asset management systems, which will help to identify and eliminate uh, waste. In concluding, he touched on quite a number of uh, areas in his um, you know, conclusions. And uh, in driving and embedding operational excellence, he talked about key elements. One of them, of course, earlier mentioned effective asset management. He went into details about that. Identifying and eliminating waste, making data-driven -driv decisions, and leveraging on digital solutions. And in ending, he gave us a few takeaways. To embed operational excellence as a way of life, to prioritize low cost oil production, not always to go and drill, because he talked about an example of where production was doubled without having to drill any new development wells, renegotiating contracts and allocating capital based on value. Talked about building a diversified competitive and resilient portfolio for a sustainable future, data-driven decision-making and benchmarking, strategic partnerships for policies, co-creation, innovation and increased funding for research and development. Domiciliation of technology is quite uh, important. Instead of just importing technologies, adapting them. Domiciliation of R&D and technologies. And finally, fiscal and regulatory clarity. So you can see that that's quite a lot that has been taken in in the course by these excellent uh, keynote um, addresses and lectures. So I will now um, turn over to the panelists to give us their three minutes view of these keynote uh, messages and the lecture. And I will start with the representative of the executive secretary of the PTDF, Mr. Gide. Uh, Mr. Gide, you have three minutes to do a quick introduction and uh, your own perspectives about what has been discussed so far. Hello, can you can can I still be heard? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, standing on all the other existing protocol. I can see from the program that uh, 
we've been asked specifically to comment on uh, industry, government, and academia partnership. And I can say generally that within the context of SP main topic today, our major responsibility at the PTDF is all about industry, government, and academia partnership. It is very evident in all the program we're doing from our human capital and institutional capacity building. All the program we're doing under education and training, which has to do with scholarship at various levels, MSc and PhD, the, conf the short program we're doing for stakeholders in the industry, which has to do with conferences and workshops, just to develop the necessary human capital in the industry, because that is the basis of all transformation, either digital, physical, or envisage. And uh, in our local content development, which is doing in partnership with other agencies like NCDMB, we turn into different specialized training, where that's training and not the rest, to be able to enhance the capability in the industry. We have not only done that, we attach all those graduates of those uh, programs into different companies in the private industry for further training, and we pay them stipend as the time goes. In our instrument capacity programs, we have gone into what we call university upgrade program. In about 26 universities across the country, what is this about? We go to each university and look for a relevant oil and gas department, either in geosciences, in engineering, in non chemical engineering in Amadi Bailey University, we don't geology in the University of Buduburi, we don't geology at the University of Pafemaolo University, petroleum engineering in UI, gas engineering in Potakot. We've done uh, petrochemical engineering in the University of Lagos. What do we do there? We construct, we do a new, brand new building for them. We do IT, soft and hard. We train the teachers. We give them a enabling environment. These are ways we're doing to enhance because charity begins at home. You can't be sending students to overseas without developing the capability right inside there. Those are the things we have done. Without taking too much uh, time, I think uh, that's briefly enough for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Engineer Jide Ademulehi. Thank you for that um, you know, very brief and concise remarks. So I will then go over to the next panelist and I will call on the representative of the Managing Director and CEO of CEPLAT, Okemba. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, and I'm um, standing on existing protocols. Um, listening to the lectures that have been presented so far, it is clear that our industry um, needs to adapt to the future that we see. Um, energy transition is real, and uh, this industry is, is um, expected to play a more active role um, in that journey. And for us in this country, uh, we are blessed with gas, and we see that as part of, part of the energy transition journey. Uh, we see that um, as, a, 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 as a cleanup flow that takes us into the renewable space in the future. And given the kind of outlook we have for all price, Efficiency, operational excellence is something that we all have to imbibe so that we can continue um, to run viable and profitable businesses into the future. And one perspective that I will bring as well is emerging challenges in financing projects in the oil and gas sector. And I will be talking about the ESG imperatives uh, for successful financing using the recently concluded um, financing for the annual gas plant projects. Uh, I'll be back shortly to talk about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Okemba. Um, again, you know, for being very concise and crisp and straight to the point. I will then move forward and um, go to my very good friend, the general manager at JV Operations of NAPIMS, Mrs. Atuche, to give her own, you know, three minutes uh, comments on the topic. Okay, thank you very much, uh, the moderator. Uh, the topic I was assigned is the adjusting operational model to reduce cost and optimize value. We all know that uh, cost is the greatest uh, uh, subject affecting our operations today. 
And the, we have identified the major cost drivers as HR cost, logistic, direct handling costs, which uh, represents almost 70% of the OPEX. And we'll be given a mandate uh, by the Honorable Minister of Petroleum Resources to get down to a UOC of $10 per barrel. And uh, the GMD of uh, NMPC uh, directed the uh, mappings, which drives the national EMP investment to work with the industry players and be able to find a solution to these uh, costs issue. The up upstream cost efficiency transformation framework developed by NACLIS has five levels, with traditional being the level with the lowest efficiency and highest cost, and the uh, transformational being the level with the highest maturity and lowest unit operating cost per barrel of oil. The traditional level is a um, um, uh, has to do uh, mostly with companies that uh, uh, react to situation, uh, not uh, being very proactive. And uh, we notice that in this uh, in reacting to situations when there is low, you know, a low oil price, they they go into the reduction of lump sum payments or uh, contract payments, uh, renegotiation of contract payments, and it's observed that the, the players within this uh, uh, level, they, they operate at around $30 per barrel. The second uh, level, which is the tactical level, here we see a, a silos uh, operation model within the company. And when you operate in silos, you, 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 you increase the oil price and the operating cost. And uh, the companies that operate within this uh, particular level uh, have uh, their operating costs between 20 to $25 uh, dollar per barrel. And after the look up, uh, the look up uh, launch uh, in uh, February this year, uh, the industry uh, all agreed that we need to do something uh, drastic in order to remain in business. And this takes us to the third level, which is the collaborative, uh, collaborative level. And the collaborative level, we see collaboration uh, between, within, between assets in, in, the, in the same company. And uh, this, uh, this, the, the, this uh, level uh, is, um, shows the adoption of best practice in uh, contract approval and uh, contract that uh, used to be scattered within the uh, teams are uh, streamlined. Then this takes us to the strategic uh, level, which is where the industry is going to now. And this is the, the level where we have a uh, cross operation uh, operator collaboration, where we have shared services, where we can share services. And when you share services, you see that the unit operating cost will, will, will drop drastically. And by the time the industry uh, with the, uh, the, the guidance of uh, mappings uh, adopts this particular uh, level, then the industry will be transformed. And when we are transformed, we, the value we get from our business become exponential. It will be a very great value. Everybody will be happy with it. And there will be accelerated reduction in contracting processes through transformation collaboration and other gains. So what do we benefit from this model? If we all agree and work together and collaborate and move our industry from the, the traditional and tactical level to the transformation, uh, tra 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 transformational level, we stand to uh, have a standard metric for an organizational uh, capability to plan its business and adopt effective strategies to manage costs. It leads us to a clear definition and direction of our organizational uh, ideal business and costing process. And when we imbibe this, uh, we have practical, incremental, and exponential steps for implementation and evaluation of critical business strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, um, in conclusion, if we adopt this model, we have increased operational efficiency uh, and optimized use of resources we have drastic reduction in our operating costs following adoption of 
act, business strategies and execution, and the very positive exponential mindset, which is value-driven workforce with the right attitude and mindset, and we buy culture of continuous improvement that will lead to successful implementation of performance and process management system. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martina. That was very um, well done. Um, we, we will come back to this conversation again because um, this uh, shows that uh, NNPC NAPIMS has actually started um, taking a look at the strategic cost efficiency uh, uh, transformation we have to go through, going from traditional tactical to transformational. So thank you very much for that. We'll do a deep dive as we continue uh, this program. Um, I'll then go next to the um, Chief Technology Officer of Huawei, Mr. Wang Hua, uh, to give us his own perspective. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much, the moderator. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, friends from Nigeria and all over the world. It's such an honor to present in this wonderful SPE Energy Forum. So talking about the energy transition from the technology perspective of the view and the lectures we have received today, well, I'd like to add that uh, I believe we'd be uh, browsing new technologies widely and deeply, such as uh, the cloud computing, artificial intelligence, big data, 5G, in oil and gas uh, sector, we see the adoption rate remains very low. Such technology terms that we see here and there, but it's not enough to drive the operational excellence at current status. And second, the digital transformation needs to be scaled up. So we need to be able to scale up to be able to reach the operational excellence at a later stage. So a strong leadership with a great vision is very important but also consistent investment in the new technology R&D as uh, many, many uh, advisors before me has talked about. So by involving technology companies and encouraging its own employees to collaborate in the open environment is very crucial in the at current stage. So post COVID, we're gonna see uh, more involvement into the oil and gas sector to better shape our industry towards the digital transition. So following the program of the event, I hope that at later stage, I can share with you a bit of our company, a digital transformation journey with you and to give you some insights. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Mr. Wang. Um, very clearly, you know, uh, very clearly made points as well. And we would like that that perspective is very important because if you see uh, the successful companies in terms of leveraging operational efficiency that was shown by the lecturer, it included a lot of tech companies. And uh, your experience with Huawei and your experience in energy will be very important. So we will do a deep dive into digital transformation. I'm hoping there will be questions about that. If not, I will ask those questions. So thank you very much for your contribution. So I will now continue to the Executive Director, Total and CFO, Mrs. Tai to give our own opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, standing on existing protocols. I hope I can be seen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, without sounding like a broken record, I must admit that um, the COVID era, you know, well, even though we were locked down, it opened our eyes to see where we could improve our services. And at the end of the day, we did become a lot more efficient, I would say, uh, during that uh, space of, of the uh, COVID era. Um, yes, it is imperative that we need to work smarter. We need to work better. We need to work at um, more cost efficiency um, in our operations and be leaner and more process efficient. And at the same time, be sustainable. That's, I heard that uh, you know coming out in quite a number of the, the speeches that were made earlier. Um, for us, it's, uh, it's, it's non-negotiable. The world is changing or the world has changed, has evolved. They're moving away from what we do best, uh, but we have to move with the times and um, adapt to the new ways of working. So um, like my colleague, I will be talking on um, uh, 
funding, industrial funding in this new new dispensation. And um, I hope to gain uh, as much from this experience as everybody else. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Tai Osishoya. Um, and uh, we will do a deep dive as well. It's very good that we have a mix of people who have operating experience and also funding experience as well. So those questions will come because they're all tied into the overall essence of what we want to get out of the day. So I'll continue by inviting the representative of the executive secretary of the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board to give his opening remarks. Hello? Hello. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure it's not coming from my end. We're waiting for the representative of the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board. He's not. He's not on the panel. The representation you have on the panel is for PTDF. Oh, I see. Okay, so we will we will skip that then if it's only PTDF, and we'll then move over to the MD and Group MD and CEO of ITO, my very good friend, Mr. Victor Koronko, to give his own opening remarks. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like also to adopt the correctly adopted protocols. There's a lot of protocols have been established. I don't know which is right, which is wrong, but I will stand on all the correct ones. Um, um, for us, I tell first, we feel uh, very happy to be associated with the SBE and particularly the library lecture series, because as you would have all known or seen, the iconic library field is in OML 29. And by the grace of God, we are the operators of OML 29 with our joint venture partner, the NNPC. So nobody can be um, happier than I am here today being associated with this uh, library lectures. And sitting down and listening, even though I still have to make a wrap up speech, I think that uh, this industry today is facing critically three major issues. Number one, was energy transition, which started before COVID. And if you all recall, most of the majors are announcing how they will become high voltage companies rather than oil and gas companies. So what am I saying? There's a lot more commitment and investment going into electricity than in oil and gas globally from the announcements that, uh, that we have seen. The second thing that we face, which came out of COVID, uh, not necessarily new to us, but a little bit more dangerous. And that was the volatility in the oil price. And, uh, first time in my career history that I had oil price going negative. Then the, the third thing is a consequence of the energy transition is the demand side. So you see that projections are actually getting slimmer and slimmer for oil and gas demand getting into the future. So what does that mean to the industry? It means you either re-strategize, reshape, 
or literally without being sounding fatalistic, you die. But I'm sure nobody goes into an investment with the view to die. So what that means, and one of the speakers here did uh, mention it, we have to ensure that we become agile and we are able quickly to reinvent ourselves, re-strategize, because the world we are facing is a world where the landscape is now totally different. It's no longer business as usual. So in a nutshell, what I will say is that we have to leverage technology. You've seen some presentations today how technology companies are far performing oil and gas companies. So that is the future. Incidentally, what we've been used to and um, have actually utilized during this lockdown period is more of the communication technology. But as we move in, there's going to be operational technology and the integration of operational technology and communications technology lies the challenge that we have to face as an oil and gas industry in trying to remain competitive. So I would like to end here uh, until I come back to give the wrap up speech. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Savik. Victor Kronko, that uh, very well done. Uh, you captured the fact that uh, they were okay, just before yes. you continue us on your kind permission. Do you would you need my assistance with the um, questions? Yes, or, I will. I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah, the online questions, or you you go with that, sir. No, I have the online questions. Um, I will ask them in, in case there are additional questions that are not covered with what I can see in the QA room, then you can ask those additional questions. Yeah, if there are some that you've received, uh, maybe in the room where you are. Q and A link now. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can yes. hear you, sir. Okay. So um, let me just do a quick wrap up of what we've heard so far. Um, we have heard from the PTDF about all their efforts in human capital development. We've heard from uh, Seplat about portfolio optimization and gas, um, and especially with respect to how they have managed to attract funding for the Arno gas project. The GMJV talked about the cost optimization strategy in moving from the traditional technical to transformational. Huawei talked about digitalization, uh, the ED of Total, uh, specifically for cost and funding. And, the, and ways of attracting funding at these uh, very challenging times. And finally, the GMD of ITO talked about, uh, you know, the challenging demands of oil and gas, um, the fact that uh, we need to re-strategize or die, in his own words, and leveraging technology for operational and, um, you know, development uh, technology for advancing operational excellence. So I will go to the questions and based on this structure in which um, you know, the different panelists have spoken. I will allocate the uh, questions that I have in the Q&A room to them accordingly. So the first question we have here is from Kola Wale Akeredolu. And he says, good morning to the guest speaker, the panelists and all attendees. My question, what can we do in the petroleum industry to respond swiftly to the global energy shift. And um, I will um, pass that on to the Group Managing Director of ITO to respond to that. Oh, can I see? Yeah, um, just to be sure that I heard you correctly, what do we do to... Um, what can we do in the petroleum industry to respond swiftly to the global energy shift? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? I just want you to repeat the 
question so I can understand clearly what to answer. Okay. What can we do in the petroleum industry to respond swiftly to the global energy shift? Thank you. I think that is um, it's a very important question. Um, the reality is when you talk about global energy shift, is the same as talking about the energy transition. And if you break it down to the common man, mankind has always faced energy transition. It started from, I think, the Stone Age to oil, driving industries, then to coal. And now um, we are back to uh, oil and gas. And gratefully, Nigeria is endowed with a lot of natural gas. So leveraging our natural gas potential first will drive our electricity generation uh, on which we are far, far behind. So I want to commend the Honorable Minister of Petroleum and his uh, lieutenants, the uh, GMD and NPC, the uh, Director DPR on the initiative of the gas revolution for which I think my dear brother here, who is the program manager, is, uh, is sitting. So what we need to do as a country is use the, risk, the, the revenues accruing to us from oil to ensure that we develop our natural gas potential, ensure that we electrify our country, because today, the demand, as I said, is more of electricity than oil. Everybody here probably has one or two mobile phones. It's not oil that charges it. It is electricity. And the mobile phones don't care where the electricity comes from. All it needs is to get the juice, and then it, and then it works. And you heard about uh, uh, alternative fuel vehicles coming. It's all either natural gas or electricity. So Nigeria stands very much at the vantage point today, uh, ever than before, to unlock its huge natural gas potential in order to prepare for this energy transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, and uh, very well um, uh, put forward. Um, following on on that, because uh, Victor did mention is about electricity, and also pointed out that uh, uh, gas uh, will be the possibly next uh, major energy uh, transition we go to in Nigeria. The following question comes from Gochuku Anona. Says gas is seen as the intermediate, I think it means energy of the future. What is the role of the Nigerian government in ensuring cost effectiveness, improve investment, energy security and availability? So um, I will go to the GMJV, this is Martina Tute, to talk about the aspect of that question that relates to cost effectiveness and improving investment and energy security. And then I'll follow that almost immediately by going to the Okemba from Seplat to talk about you know, gas utilization. So can we have uh, Martina Tute to talk about the cost effectiveness during this transition to gas? What do we need to do? Hey, thank you, Dr. Roberto. As I mentioned earlier, um, if, if we are able to work together and uh, optimize our costs and uh, transit from traditional way of doing things, we will not say that uh, I'm only interested in gas. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, my department handles gas and my gas assets. And we work together collaboratively because oil and gas go together. Oil and gas go together. So if we can optimize this cost by sharing it, if we have a rig, for example, and uh, it is operating within maybe a land rig, so all those that want to uh, HP80 uh, rig, which uh, which is uh, normally used for for gas gas well drilling, then it can be shared. So the the issue of company A going to uh, uh, mobilize a rig and company B going to mobilize a rig, we can do it in such a way that we have a, 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 a rig sequence 
for all the gas wells we're going to build, uh, maybe eastern uh, part of the country uh, uh, on land. So one week we go, we will go from asset to asset and build it. And by so doing, the cost of bringing the, the, the gas to the surface will be drastically reduced. So uh, we need to move from tactical level to strategic, where we share services. And with that, we have a reduction in cost and our gas uh, production and optimization will be, will be uh, uh, very profitable, very profitable. And we share lines, maybe everybody's going towards, uh, is, uh, maybe your market is uh, the NLNG. We, we share the transportation cost. So if the cost will be drastically reduced and revenue will go, will go up. And uh, we, we, we all smile together and uh, uh, the business will continue to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again for stressing the need to go from traditional tactical to strategic and transformative, and also the points that you made about um, collaboration. So I, like I said, I will go over to Okemba to talk first about these experience in terms of, in terms of gas as a transition um, uh, fuel, especially with respect to the anno gas plant, maybe touch on a few issues around the challenges of funding, but again, also talk about collaboration because I know your uh, MDC or the Brown is very, very strong on collaboration. So, uh, Okemba, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. This is quite an interesting and important subject to address at this conference. And, and starting with um, collaboration, um, Anogas Processing Company is, is a good example of that collaboration. It's a company set up by NMPC and CEPLAT, 50-50 uh, equity holding. So we've come together to set up a midstream company and the first um, midstream gas focused company that will build um, a midstream gas processing plant to commercialize the um, huge um, gas reserves in the anode field. So for me, really, that, that is the way to, to go. Working in partnerships, it, is, uh, it optimizes costs and enables us to deliver. But talking about um, gas being a transition fuel and an important one for Nigeria uh, in terms of improving our electricity generation, I, I would like to make this point. In Nigeria today, uh, power generation through the grid is usually somewhere between 4,000 to 5,000 megawatts per day. But power generation outside the grid is somewhere between 20 to 25 gigawatts. And this self-generation is essentially happening using diesel and petrol generators. So we are generating a lot more, in my view, in a, in a cost inefficient manner and in a way that doesn't really help um, um, climate, um, climate change. So, so for us, th that transition starts um, with displacing diesel and petrol generation with gas-fired generation. When you do that, you reduce carbon emissions um, into the environment by at least 30 percent. And also, it is um, a lot cheaper to generate electricity through um, gas-fired power stations. But for us to deliver that unique transition for Nigeria, you require a lot of funding to make this happen. And the terrain today is changing very fast with respect to funding. Today, if you require funding to execute your projects and you need international lenders and investors to be part of it, your environmental, social, and governance credentials will be assessed. So that assessment will be done to understand your commitment towards um, ESG, and um, you will have to be categorized. There are three categories, A, B, and C, depending on the level of impact that project will have on environmental and social issues. So happily, most gas projects can be categorized as B, meaning that the impact, the environmental and social impact is limited and can be mitigated by committing to an environmental and social action plan. So in, in successfully closing our financing for the annual project, uh, midstream gas project, we had to go through that process and had to make those commitments. Uh, as challenging as they are, they have their advantages. One is that your pricing can be linked to your performance of those ESG um, commitments so that as they achieve those KPIs, you see your 
cost of funding um, coming down. But most importantly, is actually access to a wider and more diverse pool of, of, of funding. Because there are investors today that will not lend to you, that will not invest in your project if you don't have um, ESG commitments. You know, so, so as we move forward with the challenges that our industry faces, it's important that operators uh, start early to think about their ESG um, credentials. And for us in Nigeria, an easy way to start is to look at the gas in your portfolio and start to develop them. And when you can um, you know, create that positive Im impact by displacing diesel, petrol with gas, in our own case, we're also gonna be producing LPG. And with that, you can have a cleaner cooking fuel for people in the communities and move them away from firewood and charcoal and all of that. So that starts your journey. Uh, in terms of an energy transition and, and positions you on, on a better platform to be able to attract the financing you require to continue to grow. Well, thank you very much, Okemba. Thank you very much on that. Um, that experience um, in terms of uh, what, how you have to position yourself for funding and also the moves that Seplat is making in terms of uh, the transition to gas as the cleaner fossil fuel. I'll now move over to the Executive Director and CFO of Total, um, to talk a little bit uh, about Total's experience. And I'll put a little thing, a few things in perspective. Total was the last uh, major IOC in Nigeria to um, execute uh, a major oil project, that's the Gina project. Um, on the back of that have been all these discussions about ESG, the transition of, to energy, and there are all the challenges of finding funding. Uh, for these uh, projects. Now, how is Total taking a look at this entire energy transition mix with funding, ESG, and also how is this impacting portfolio optimization in Total? Good afternoon, once again. I thank you very much for this, um, this uh, topic. I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, so for Total, we have um, been been looking at this this uh, transition transition move, I would say, to a new, cleaner, affordable, and sustainable energy. And um, we we have, as you all aware, we are members of the Paris uh, Climate Accord, whereby we have taken the commitment to reduce um, the, the global temperature rise by two degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial levels. Um, and at the same time, it is established that about 10 billion people worldwide will still require access to energy by 2050. So there's a dichotomy between growth of, in energy demand and the climate change commitment. On the environmental side, uh, we, we have taken a big commitment to move and transition into the energy space. We've taken remarkable steps to reduce our carbon footprint. And in Nigeria specifically, we have um, carbon reduction efforts in place to be able to harness uh, the gas where uh, as uh, we produce our, our, our oil and to be able to achieve a net zero carbon emissions by 2020 project is in place. Um, at the same time, we also want to extend this to our um, clients so that even as they continue to consume energy, we can assist them also in reducing the carbon footprint and move also towards cleaner and uh, more efficient energy. Okay, and of course we have targets in place. Uh, we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from all our facilities uh, from 46 metric tons of uh, carbon, um, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, CO2 emissions in, by 2015, in 2015 to 40 metric tons of CO2 emissions by 2025. So we have targets, strong targets in place, and we are working very systematically to achieving that. Our projection is that by 2030, we want to be able to supply a third more energy than we did in 2015, but with a lot fewer uh, emissions around the world. Now this we can't do without funding and without um, keeping tabs on the environmental and social standards in place. Um, as um, my colleague from CEPLAT said, the international lenders are very attentive as to where they invest their money. 
they no longer want to be seen as uh, brown companies. They all want to be seen as green companies and putting their uh, funds in clean energy. But having said that, we know that we, we still need oil to fund, uh, we still need oil and gas to be able to fund the cleaner energy, energy space as well. So the, the, the lenders have put very stringent um, environmental health and safety guidelines in place. Um, I'll just mention a few. Um, there's the, um, the World Bank and the IFC environmental health and safety guidelines. There are guidelines for liquefied natural gas facilities. There are guidelines also for ports, harbors, and terminals, for shipping, for workers' accommodation. Um, there's the performance standards by the IFC. And, uh, and we have what we call also the equity principles um, 2013 guidelines, which was uh, adopted by various banks and financial institutions to set guidelines to provide a financial industry benchmark for determining, assessing, and managing the social and environmental risks in project financing. So these are all very stringent measures they've put in place and they do follow them out uh, diligently. They insist that we must have environmental and social action plans, which they can monitor and measure as we progress with, with our projects. And uh, in the Nigerian space, there is also the Nigerian sustainable banking principles, which also um, insist that if there's any conflict between any of these standards on any particular project, then the most stringent of these um, um, guidelines will prevail. Um, I just want to also mention that um, because we are moving from um, an oil and gas setting to a renewable energy setting, um, we need to ensure that our fiscal regimes and our regulatory regimes are stable to be able to attract new investment into these areas. And so that's why, you know, in a nutshell, we, we welcome very much that um, the government is now very enthusiastic about passing the uh, PIB because that would attract new investment, particularly in the, the deep offshore and um, gas, gas development sectors. I hope I have answered your questions. You, you have excellently. Thank you very much for that. Uh, giving us that perspective, especially with respect to uh, what uh, the funding parties, including uh, big institutions like the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation are doing with ensuring that people have uh, ESG consciousness uh, and also understand that the carbon footprint is part of these conversations. I'm also happy that the Nigerian banks, like you've mentioned, have taken on this um, uh, issue with respect to how they are going to fund. So the most important message out there, I think, is for any newcomers or existing players in the industry to be aware about the challenges, you know, uh, you know that will will come with this energy transition. So you know that that in, in a nutshell is around the portfolio optimization aspects of this conversation about the fact that you must be aware that, and I, the, clearly by the ED of total that oil and gas will still drive some of the investments as um, revenue from oil and gas, but slowly that will start drying up and we have to start taking a look first at gas and then later on at other cleaner and renewable sources of energy. Thank you very much for that. So I'll go back to the um, uh, uh, questions that uh, we have online. Um, uh, and one of them I think is of particular relevance to data. And I will ask the um, uh, Hawaii, the CTO for Hawaii, to speak a little bit about uh, this. And this is uh, really around, and uh, I think this question is um, from George Onuma, although he specifically says it's for engineer Martin Atiche and Okemba. There's a part there about collaboration. And he talks about collaboration and uh, systems management um, in the industry to align it with the great opportunities and make sure that it's equitable for service providers. On the back of this is how do we leverage on data, big data, internet of things, digitalization, to make sure that we can create collaboration platforms to help to drive down mm -hmm. costs and increase uh, operational efficiency. As your thoughts. 
Okay, it's a it's a great question. Um, so uh, talking about digital transformation, data plays a, a crucial role. You know, as everybody moving uh, towards digital trans transformation, and how do we collect the data? How do we effectively using those data? And uh, we can do a data mining nowadays. Uh, people talking about uh, data lake, putting the data in a common place where multiple disciplines can get access to it. But there's no common place for the for the uh, software vendors to come up with this kind of solution where you can share the data effectively. Everyone keep their uh, barriers, keep the different formats. So now there's a, a something called open uh, um, open group OSDU where the the subsurface data can be managed in a, in a standardized uh, format. And we built towards that uh, um, data lake using that data structure. So everyone get access to it, will be able to share not only the data, but the workflow across different uh, software vendors. That will create the real collaborative environment for everyone to share the data. That's our ultimate goal. So Huawei is also uh, joining that OSDU group to develop our cloud-based solutions, joining with Microsoft, Google, and AWS together to solve these fundamental issues for data sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I hope this is something that SPE can follow up on um, to uh, this cloud-based uh, sharing of data is very critical in terms of uh, how uh, we manage to go forward in understanding what we need to do to bring down uh, costs. Um, again, I think uh, the, these platforms, collaboration platforms, questions around the vendor management system are all based on the technology that allows data mining to take place. So thank you very much for that uh, one. Now, um, I'll move further. Uh, there is a question here, and I was hoping there would be one on human capital development. This is coming from Olayemi Samuel O. He says, it's very obvious that the world is transiting from fossil fuels to cleaner energy with little or less carbon emissions, which may leave us with little or no re relevance as petroleum engineers. What does the future hold in store for the students studying petroleum engineering? And I will, of course, pass that on to the representative of the executive secretary of the PTGF, who talked about human capital development and their efforts to give a response. Thank you. Um, okay, the, uh, Mr. Olayemi, you have nothing to fear. Recently, you will read, and maybe you have not heard that um, Imperial College are planning to scrap their petroleum geoscience uh, department to replace it with something else. We know that the skills that are required in the industry is uh, changing. We're looking at big data, we're looking at commerce, particularly in the middle and downstream. But I can tell you that if you are brilliant, you are brilliant. If you can do well in petroleum engineering, you can easily adapt to big data because you have the fundamental, uh, you have the fundamentals and the natural talent to do well. So you have nothing to fear. Even when you do not adapt, the process of working these days, IT, information technology, has actually brought together all the fields. You can't say you're a petroleum engineer and all you are doing throughout your career is practicing petroleum engineering. At this stage, you will have to, to, to add other skills to yourself, and uh, you won't have problem doing this. At the PTDF, we are investing resources in adding new courses in renewable energy, in data management, and all the rest. If you go online, you go to our website, you will see all the other courses that, you can, that can be useful to you, particularly postgraduate, so that your skills will be enhanced. So there's nothing to fear. Either you're a geoscientist or a petroleum engineer, you will still have your relevance by further development and further studies within and outside Nigeria. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Again, it, sees, it says that PTDF is uh, looking into the future 
and has started adapting his courses in line with international practice, make sure that you know, those brilliant uh, students of engineering can actually start learning more about um, new technology, renewable energy and all that. So uh, the student who has the question and the students listening, there goes, that's the opportunity for you. Now, uh, coming back again um, to, you know, another round of questions. Um, and I will take as many as I can before uh, we conclude this. There is a question by Menezo, Menezo MZ. And uh, this will be directed at uh, the CTO for Huawei. And he's talking about the fact that um, he concluded, he concludes that the survival of energy industry will depend largely on innovative technologies. And he's asking what are the measures and backbone layout to domesticate technology interventions in relation with foreign helpers. And he specifically mentions like Wang Hao to reduce service costs to sustain operations in the long run. So um, uh, Mr. Wang, uh, the question really to put it more in a, in a summary you can help is your experience with Hawaii as chief technology officer. Well, Hawaii has expanded into other areas, including uh, Nigeria, especially in their telecommunications business. But you have an energy unit. How are you going to be able to not only adapt technology from Hawaii that is developing in energy and telecommunications, but also help with domesticating that technology in Nigeria? All right. Thank you, moderator. So as Huawei now is a global company, we operate in 170 countries in the world. So we are global footprint will help us to position our technologies in by regions. So we built out 36 innovation centers across the globe. So in each continent, we will have a several innovation center to help the local community to build and develop their specific technologies to fit the purpose for the basin. Not only for the basin, but together with our ecosystem, like you just mentioned, we start with the telecommunication and all the industries we worked on to bring the ecosystem into the full picture of what we offer into the oil and gas sector. Like I mentioned before, how, how do we measure digital transformation? It's by scale. If you do one experiment, you cannot judge that the cost will be saved. You have to do that in a big scale. I would like to take Adnok as an example. Adnok, as you have heard, they have uh, built a, a huge Panorama Center in uh, 2018. So over the three years, their investment has been uh, valued. In the recent uh, press, they uh, announced that they have been saving about 1 billion US dollar by deploying that Panorama Center. What is the Panorama about? It's just a bit of big data and AI. It's not everything the new technology has been uh, showing in that panorama. But over the years, they're going to adapt to new technologies in that platform for the whole subsidiaries in the whole Adnoc group. So that will illustrate the new technology has helped our oil and gas companies to move forward ahead of digital transformation by saving a huge money investing in the early stage. So by answering the question, lower down the cost is the long term, is the long journey like a digital transformation. Today, you adopt a new technology. You may not be easy to, uh, to uh, judge whether the investment can be shortly seen in a three or four months period of time, but over a long term, three, four, five years going forward, you will be beneficial from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wang. And it's very clear the role Huawei and uh, such um, companies that have internationalized their technology and have moved them into countries and are trying to domesticate them in such a way that it will have an impact on reducing costs, whether it is in telephony or in energy as uh, Hawaii expands into the energy space as well. So thank you very much for that. Now, I'll come back to um, a question which 
I would leave open for any of the panelists to raise their hand. If I wait for a few seconds and there's nobody, I will have to assign it. So this is from Olukayode Ayeni. And he says, it is commendable that government is actively thinking of driving down the unit operating costs. However, can we ask how this has been factored into the PIB to make the investment climate easier to operate and lower costs? He wants examples in the PIB fiscals that helps in lowering operating costs. Uh, is any of our panelists uh, willing to jump in on that immediately? It's really around how has this cost of optimization mantra and the processes that we're going, has it been factored into the PIB? Okay, um, if uh, none of the panelists is able to do that, maybe I'll come at the end and uh, close out on what I understand about, um, you know, that question about on the, uh, you know, how cost optimization has been factored into the PIB. But just quickly, there is a, a cost efficiency part of that uh, PIB that so, basically rewards companies that manage also cost lower. Yes, please. Okay, so the minister's chief of staff would like to take a go at your at the question. Wonderful. Can we have the minister's chief of staff come in there? Uh, thank you very much. I want to say that uh, this is uh, I'm not function. I'm not speaking on behalf of the minister. <laughs> so don't quote the minister. <laughs> but all I know as um, as member of the committee that work on the PIP, is that fiscal regime of the PIP for investors, if not the best, is going to be the second to third best in Africa. The fiscal regime as it is today in the PIP. That is very sure. And uh, one of the areas that we discover that is driving costs up in Nigeria is um, the local communities. And this is well taken care of in the PIP. So, and uh, just last week, we were at Aqua Ipon, and uh, we addressed the local community. They are very happy. They ask pertinent questions, and we answer them. But this PIP is so robust, and it's going to take care of the local community. This PIB is so robust, it's going to be investor friendly. This PIB is so robust, the federal government is going to have its fair share of it. And they're so robust that even when advantage is given or opportunity is given to the investor, whether it may in the uh, old fiscal regime or go to the new one, we have seen the, 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 the investors, Emma's, trying to select the, 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 the new fiscal regime, I say. So why? Because they have seen something that is so robust there. And we know that we are going to tweak the, the, the Deep Offshore Act. We are proposing that, but the final decision lies on the uh, legislature that are working at this moment. Just at the beginning of this week, uh, there was a retreat uh, in the suburb of Abuja, and they are putting some uh, some uh, perfection into the PIB. And when it comes out, I'm sure everybody, every one of us will be happy with it. And that is why we are confident to say that when the PIB is passed, there will be new opportunities. There will be available acreages. There will be a lot of uh, mass uh, employment opportunity for our youth. And it's all doing when everybody is happy, when things are working fine. I believe investors will be happy too. There will be foreign direct investment and the whole uh, economy will go. And in a happy economy, I think uh, everybody will be happy. Nigeria in particular, of, um, for Africa in general. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, the representative of the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources for taking that on. 
Um, can I ask uh, the MC, uh, Richard, whether you have any questions there um, that are not on the Q&A platform? And I would also request the admin who have suggested there are other questions coming in outside the Q&A platform to try and post the, them on there so I can take them on. So Richard, are there any questions you have? So I, I do, sir. I, you know, it's a unique uh, event we're doing these days is hybrid. The questions I have here are handwritten in the hall. We've done that to manage the time uh, it would take to ask those questions. They, the first one is to you. So I will, I will read it last. I'll read it last. That one is to you. Uh, this one is from um, Ogenerume Ogolo of Nile University. Ogene is saying, what is the view of the industry in adopting the modified unit technical cost model that is much more accurate than the unit technical cost currently used in the industry? Research done by my colleagues and I, she says, have shown that the traditional UTC has some inherent challenges. Did you get that, sir? Yes, I did. Uh, and the question You're was muted. directed at me. Sir, I just want to read two questions to you. Two questions to you, and then yeah, I'll read so your own Is that next. question directed at me to answer? No, 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 no. It's not directed at you, to the panel. Anybody can, you can assign to anybody to take on that. But the one directed to you is what I want to read now. Okay. Okay. So the one directed to you says, is from Harrison A. Day, uh, his affiliation is the media. So I want Ogachi Keze to speak on modular refineries resolution and possible concerns as he is a key player. I'll, I'll leave, I'll give you that too. I have some more, but because of time, I'll leave you with that too for now. When you answer, if there's more time because we should be winding this down. Uh, I, I, I sent you a, a private chat, I'm sure you saw it. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I'll take that answer about modular refineries at the very end before I hand over to Victor Cohen for to wrap up. So, um, the question, and again, I will leave it open. I, I know I have reviewed the research work on modified unit technical costs. Um, I am not certain, and I'll just put that out. Uh, does anybody on the panelists, has anybody seen the, doc, the paper on modified unit technical costs versus unit technical costs? And if you have, you can immediately start taking on that question. Okay, in the absence of any quick response on that, let me just say that I have seen the academic paper on modified unit technical costs. And yes, uh, there's a belief that the unit technical costs uh, sometimes omits and sometimes you know, um, you know, captures a lot more in, in, in inherent in it that um, does not directly show uh, what that technical cost of the business is. So the way the modified unit technical cost, if I understand it, has been used to approach is to make it directly relatable to um, the uh, profitability of the business. Because sometimes when you look at unit technical costs, especially the component of unit technical costs that is a uh, capital expenditure, the unit development cost, and the way it is treated, uh, the way uh, the, the, um, the, the effects of you know, phasing it over time and all that uh, does not properly capture its input into economics, the run economics to show clearly the profitability of companies. So yes, I think um, as we go along, this modified unit technical cost approach will be important, not to totally replace the unit technical cost approach that is currently ongoing, but to create some kind of comparison and benchmark once the differences are clearly understood. So I hope uh, that helps to address that. So it's a, a very important piece of academic literature, which I think we should start operationalizing and using it to compare to the outcomes using the standard unit technical costs, okay? Yeah, so um, I will go on to the panelists, back to the panelists with some of the additional questions uh, that we have uh, received online. And um, there is a question, um, the question that's coming from Dr. Sarah Winai. 
And Dr. Sarah says, new technologies to drive operational excellence are to me out of research and development. How can the industry support the academia to grow homegrown technologies through research and development? So I am going to pose this question to two of the panelists. I'd like to have a take from the PTDF first, and then I would then call on uh, Seplat to give an industry view of how the industry can support academia to grow, to uh, grow home grown or domesticate technology. Support um, Luca Academia to grow technology, meaning that to be more involved in R and D. That's my understanding. For us, at the PTDF, we have two main programs. One we call University Endowment Program, which um, institute professorial endowment research in universities across the country, which we have done in all in each university in each geopolitical zone. The one in Amadou Bello University is particularly interested in chemical engineering. They worked on zeolite development. And to those of us that know it very well, zeolite is a very key catalyst in the, in the refinery industry. As it is now, we have patented it. We are working with NMPC and the Dangote Refinery and some representative of the, of the industry to introduce it to the private sector. That's the work that emanated from a university and is going commercial now. We understand that in the refinery, they spend billions and billions of dollars to import zeolite every year. And zeolite is so important that without it, refineries cannot work. So that is an encouragement given to the university, the academia, and it's going commercial. And in all the universities where we have endowment program, the professors, they have our MSc, PhD, students attached to them that are working with them. I don't have to go through all the interesting topics they are doing. That's number one vehicle. We have another vehicle we call um, Annual Research uh, Grant Program. Because we identify that there are some people in the industry, retired experts in the industry. They are not necessarily in the university and they are keen on research. They have some area they would have loved to work, to work on when they were in service, they didn't have the time now they are outside so we just establish a grant they can apply start their research program we grant them the grant so it's not even necessarily you don't have to be in the university those are the things we are doing i will give the rest for sepla to talk specifically of the industry thank you very much for that uh, can we get an industry perspective from sepla okay thank you thank you very much moderator I think this is a fitting question to, to assign to me. Um, at um, Anno Gas Processing Company, as I said, a company jointly owned by NNPC and CEPLAT. Uh, one of the commitments we have um, reached with NCDMV um, um, is actually a project at University of Port Harcourt um, to fund a technical training center that will promote research and training uh, for students um, across the country. is a major facility that we are gonna be financing. And the expectation is that it will serve as a center of excellence. And interestingly, PTDF is part of it, right? So it's a joint effort, again, another collaboration to promote skills acquisition, to promote research, training and, and development. And uh, when that project is completed, it will provide um, a, a good platform uh, to upskill um, people within the industry. And, and I know that other industry players in different forms through, as part of CSR programs, a number of companies have these um, vocational and technical training programs for um, the communities around them and generally for students in the studying programs that relate to the sector. So those efforts will continue. And I have to commend NCDMB for coming up with those ideas and thoughts 
and um, encourage operators to work closely with them to ensure that we improve the capacity um, of our people. One of the questions that was asked earlier is about domesticating technology. For that to happen successfully, you must have trained um, and skilled individuals within the countries um, to be able to work with the technology firms and uh, make that dream to, to happen. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Okemba, for that. Um, I will go to a couple of, uh, we, we, we are quickly running out of time, and I'd like to also give all the panelists about a minute at the end to wrap up their thoughts. But I'll go to uh, uh, Mrs. Martina uh, um, Atuche, the GMJV. And um, if the question is around um, NUCOPS, the uh, Nigerian Upstream Cost Optimization Project. Uh, can you give us some insights on where we stand with respect to NUCOP, um, how it is we expect it to uh, affect operational excellence? What is the rollout plan? Um, what additional things do we need to know or do as an industry to help to support this? Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Well, um, I want to refer us back to this transformation maturation uh, model. Um, after the new COP, we've seen migration of the industry towards the collaborative and strategic uh, level. Because now everybody has come to agree after the launch that we need to do something to our costs. And for us to do something to our costs, um, we, we need to um, cut down, we need to collaborate more between companies. And presently, uh, we're working on uh, work streams. We have uh, specific items we, we, we think uh, within the short uh, term that uh, we can achieve uh, a progress. We we'll formed work streams, we constructed committees. That is a, a, a strategic level now. We commit, uh, we constructed committees, and we have uh, written to the industry, and uh, we're still awaiting their their uh, nominations, so that we now work as a team. We have items like the, the logistic, uh, as I mentioned earlier, which is one of the major cost driver where we have shared services like uh, supply vessels when we go to, uh, at, a, at different, uh, different locations. For example, we have the NCTL corridor where we have some operators within there. There are things that will be shared. So in those work streams, we have the logistic work stream, we have the crude handling uh, uh, work stream where we are negotiating uh, the the CHAs, the crew handling agreements, we want to negotiate them uh, downwards. Then uh, we, we have the uh, inventory management work streams. We have the, the contracting work streams because we want to reduce the, the contracting cycle. And we have observed that in our contracting, the, 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 uh, we spend a lot of time doing, uh, doing the technical evaluation phase. So uh, we want to equally work on the joint uh, uh, JPS uh, so that uh, the companies that are giving codes that are qualified to do such codes. And these uh, contract review uh, uh, um, sessions will be, uh, will be done maybe twice a year so that we we're sure that technically the, the companies within a code will be able to deliver such activity. So we just go straight to the commercial. Well, once we go to the JPS, we pick those companies, go straight to commercial because we have already done the, the, the uh, technical evaluation uh, uh, beforehand. Then with that, we will we, we see that uh, we, we are going to where we're supposed to go. And that is the transformation map. And then by the time we get there, we have a reduction in our operating costs. So the industry is, a, is a, we have all bought into it. We know that if we don't kill the cost, the cost will kill us. So we, we need to work on the cost and we are working on the cost. And uh, 
you know, the, the impact of the UOC. UOC is a, 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 a recurring, is a recurring um, uh, expense. So that is why we're concentrating on reducing the UOC. Something like the, the CapEx are part of the business. It's something you take a very long time. So uh, you cannot uh, measure, measure it. So that is why we're concentrating on the, the UOC. The industry is, uh, is uh, cooperating and uh, we know by the end of third quarter this year, um, the industry will feel the impact of the uh, outcome of the uh, new launch. Thank you. Wonderful, Martina uh, Thank you very much. The is waiting. We are, you know, very desperate to make sure that uh, we can get uh, in line and start uh, pushing some of these initiatives with uh, the operators, uh, with the service companies, the rest of the industry supporting government. So I'll go over to um, a question that um, I'd like uh, the executive director and CFO of Total to um, uh, take on. And this is in terms of uh, majorly advisory. You had mentioned in your opening remarks about the fact that um, uh, the transition that um, uh, Total will go through will still be funded by the upstream oil and gas business. So the real challenge and the question I want to ask is, um, how are you going to allocate funds? Is there a particular ratio you have or you know, a, a range of allocating funds to the continuing upstream oil and gas business and to the transition to cleaner uh, and uh, renewable sources of energy? Is there you know, some sort of structure that people can learn from and also adopting their own companies. Thank you very much for that question. Um, well, we have seen that over time, our portfolio of resources, our reserves are scattered across the whole world. As you know, we're we are in 130 countries across the world. And what we have done to move the transition forward is to focus on different segments of the world to focus on different aspects of the energy mix. So in the interim, or as a first step, Europe is going to be the center of our renewable focus for now, while Africa, the US, and um, the Far East will continue to be the energy, oil and gas, I would say, contributors to, to this um, new transition. Uh, knowing that we need to pump in uh, quite a bit of funds into the um, into the renewables to make it sustainable and to grow it grow that business, so we are leveraging on what we know well and what we are, we have the capability of doing, which is oil and gas, to be able to fund this this energy mix. And over time, we have set ourselves a target for 2050, and over time, we will gradually reduce the concentration of our investments in oil and gas and fossil fuels. However, we'll keep, keep them cleaner, keep them affordable because we know there will there's still be that demand and then progressively move more and more into the uh, renewable energy space. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I will now uh, go finally to the GMD of ITO, uh, Mr. Victor Koronko. And um, uh, you know he's going to wrap up, but before he wraps up as a panelist, I'd like him to further emphasize on uh, the uh, issue of strategize or die, which we have heard from him, and also um, the comment from um, uh, Mrs. Martina Atuche, who says we reduce cost or die. And um, all this uh, dying, we need to find a way to couch this in uh, the overall topic of this uh, forum, which is around operational excellence and portfolio optimization. So what do you have to just wrap up and then you give your own uh, overall wrap up? What do we have to do in these areas from what we've heard from your view on operational excellence and portfolio optimization so that we do not die? So, so. Hello, do we still have the GMD of ITO? Right. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And um, ladies and gentlemen, permit me again to uh, stand on already established uh, protocol. You've asked me to do two things in one. Actually, the two things in my mind are together. So I've been asked to give the wrap-up speech for, for this event. And um, whether I do it or I don't do it, I will not die. But I will try to then articulate what that uh, statement referred to. For all of you who have been listening, uh, both in person and online, to all the very beautiful, eloquent, and very professional presentations we've had. There are several things that pop up and cut across almost all the presentations. Um, in, by way of traditional wrap-up, I don't think I can do it better than my brother, the Professor Chike, uh, over there. But I've picked out a few things. You've had improve efficiency. You've had cost optimization. You've had collaboration. You've had value. You've had technology. You've had skills. And you've had standardization. Above all, you've had data. You've had big data. And I think the oil and gas industry collects a lot more data than most industries. And if you look at the spectrum of data that we collect from exploration through production, in fact, we even hold a lot of meteorological data as well, uh, including Metosha. The issue of operational excellence, portfolio optimization, and essentially survival of the industry in a post-COVID world. When I uh, thought about it, I felt that we have a lot of data. We are going into a data-driven world. We are still going to collect a lot more, but the issue we have today is integration. And that integration comes with um, so many things. Now, that's pushed me to put down, share my thoughts, in what I captioned digitization, the new paradigm for oil and gas portfolio optimization post COVID. In the midst of the, the global energy transition, the oil and gas industry is still grappling with the aftermath of the twin tragedies of the dramatic crash in oil price on one hand and the collapse in the demand on the other hand. Both tragedies, as you all know, caused by the COVID-19 black swan event, which nobody foresaw and nobody planned for. So this phenomenon today has accelerated new paradigms in portfolio optimization and supply chain in the industry. With the price volatility, the geopolitical tussle between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia that we experienced during the first wave of the global lockdown, financial leadership and liquidity risk management will become and will indeed gain prominence in managing oil and gas companies uh, going forward. Now, there is digitization and big data. They have also become very key tools for success in this industry. You have to mine the existing data. You have to gather new data. You have to integrate the two. It comes with a lot of challenges. However, the industry is not out of the woods yet. The promising trends that we see in the price today is being influenced by OPEC plus production cuts. The unprecedented discovery, approvals, 
and now application of COVID-19 vaccines, hopefully, should contain the pandemic and allow national and global economies to start opening up again. The lockdown has demonstrated that with the increasing speed and capacity in connectivity, and you know, there's 5G, it is still coming in some areas, digital tools are no longer just for enabling communication. They are providing and indeed accelerating opportunities for value creation, and value capture. And they're doing this through enabling enterprise integration, doing this through communications across multiple social media platforms and multiple groups, through remote monitoring, a whole lot of task automation, and all these to enhance operational efficiency, integrity, and process safety, which is key to our industry. So today, for us, digitization is no longer an option, but a fundamental requirement for survival. Because as you have also heard, companies may have to and will have to go leaner in order to remain agile so they can respond quickly and remain competitive, particularly in the post-COVID world. However, successful implementation of digitization will require a whole lot, amongst which, and by the way, not a very exhaustive list, collaboration, which you have had uh, all about today, across multiple industry stakeholders, including investors, industry leaders, and policy makers, even regulations. Some of the regulations we need to be upscaled to accommodate the new world of uh, digitization. It will also require us that existing enterprise data architecture will have to be looked at again, will have to be uh, reformed, it will have to be reformatted. We are going, we can go back from adopting the cloud computing technology is come, is come to stay with us. The internet of things, artificial intelligence, the drone technology, social media, and a whole lot of other emerging mobile computing and communication platforms. Digitization, however, is not a free ride. We are not running on oil, if you like. It has challenges that we have to be aware of and plan for. These challenges include data security and privacy. We really have to be aware of that, that data security and privacy, we have to look at the existing regulations to be sure that they accommodate the new digital world. We have to try and standardize. You had the gentleman from Hawaii when he spoke, uh, when people have data in silo, not just globally, even in companies. There are data sitting all over in silos to bring them together, to integrate them. You need to create some form of standardization. You need to reskill your workforce. The oil and gas industry has traditionally been known for having an aging workforce because of uh, the loyalty with which the industry has grown. So people remain there like me, they don't want to leave. So, <laughs> so, but now we are confronted with the new world, the modern world, digitization, the millennials. Uh, we either have to match them or they match us. And Mr. Moderator, don't quote me again, or they kick us out. Or, or, we, or we clearly and consciously bring them in into the industry, to utilize the advantages they have over and above us for the survival of the industry. So that's what I mean by you have to rescue and retrain your staff. So competitive positioning in the upstream oil and gas sector is hinged on a delicate balance of a tripod. It's cost, it's production, and it's price. 
So leveraging digital technologies in this post-COVID world, or in the post-COVID world, it will help companies to embed a value for money mindset. And to do that, if you have a value for money mindset, you have to literally be fit. What do I mean by being fit? You have to be agile and you have to keep innovating and reinventing both yourself, your, your strategy as the case may be. This is even so important as the industry grapples with acceleration energy transition. And that simply means the rebalancing of the global energy mix. Uh, there's a school of thought that thinks that fossil fuel will go down. There's another school of thought, probably the one I belong to, thinks that what will happen is within the fossil fuel domain, the natural gas will begin to displace liquid fuel uh, gradually. And, me, and, and then the industry as a whole will have to compete with the others. Just last night, I read an article on Forbes. It's about the nuclear, uh, nuclear energy trying to also gain both acceptance and prominence within the whole uh, energy transition and, and global energy mix. So ladies and gentlemen, post COVID, We're already beginning to see some reductions in capex spending within the oil and gas space. There will still be the disruptions caused by technology, particularly uh, today, we are all going cloud-based and this new terminology of uh, twin technology is coming where there's now full integration uh, of operational systems, management systems, and, and uh, application systems into one. OPEC Plus will remain a key player, particularly as we try to balance what is coming out of the US, uh, because in the US, the trajectory seems to have changed a little bit. Uh, before now, it was just fire on, but now Paris, agreement is back and, a, and, and an ambassador has been appointed by the US government. So what that means is the push for cleaner energy, for this energy mix, the rebalancing of it, and allowing renewables to come in. So there is going to be competition. So um, Mr. Moderator, I believe that in saying all this, I probably have explained myself better but for you to remain in business, you have to do something different. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Uh, yes, uh, you've explained yourself uh, very clearly and thank you for that um, um, uh, wrap up, including uh, your comments. Uh, before we close this uh, panel session, I'd like to give all the panelists at least a minute to uh, send their key messages to the audience. So I'll start by calling on the representative of the executive secretary of the PTDF to uh, please give a one minute, one minute please wrap up your key message. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The wrap up uh, we would like to say from our own end is that uh, the view of this energy mix and uh, transition, energy transition, one thing that is most important is that we need to reskill people like the last speaker said. And so human capital development is the key area to look at and to watch out for. And that's the responsibility, the entire responsibility of uh, the Petroleum Technology Development Fund in the oil and gas industry. We need to start retraining those people that are working with us. And so we want to collaborate with the industry as a whole, in our work in designing our program, we will arrange meetings, we organize meetings, stakeholders meeting to advise us in designing our programs going forward so that Nigerians can be put in a very advantageous position in this energy transition that is facing us right away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellently well said. So uh, the next is um, uh, Mr. Okemba from Seplats to give his one minute wrap up. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I, I will close by saying for companies like um, Anogas Processing Company, that's committed to providing additional gas to the domestic market, it's important that the power sector, which is a major customer for domestic gas in Nigeria, continues to receive attention to address some of the infrastructure and um, commercial slash liquidity issues that we see in that sector so that the gas to power value chain can be more viable and one that further um, encourages um, increased um, investments into domestic gas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Okichukumba. Uh, the next I'll call on to give a one minute wrap up is the general manager JV, Mrs. Martina Atuche. Thank you, the moderator. Um, I want to encourage the industry to join hands and put all hands on deck to move our industry from traditional and practical level, which will give us incremental value and migrate to transformational, where we have exponential value of our business. And by so doing, we'll be competing with companies like Saudi Aramco with their unit operating costs, sub $8 per barrel. When we do it, everybody will be happy and uh, will be more efficient and uh, pro more profitable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martina. Um, I will, the next person I'll call on uh, is the Executive Director Total and CFO, Mrs. Tai Osisoyan. Thank you very much, Mr. Ngosi. Um, in wrapping up, I would say that um, Total, Total's Code of Conduct has two core values, safety first, and the second is respect for one another. In terms of um, moving to, from uh, an oil and gas company to a broader based energy company, we, it is our ambition and it is part of our um, steps in place to ensure that we, we carry along our communities, our host communities, our partners in the progress. We are happy with, uh, with the progress made by um, NAPIMS in terms of looking at reviewing the process, um, process optimization and reducing costs. It's one of our values as well. So on the whole, um, we're here to stay. We are not going anywhere. We are both in upstream and downstream. And um, we are here to make sure that uh, we carry our clients and customers along, the, along this journey to uh, uh, in the energy transformation process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sishanya. I will then call, last but not the least, the Chief Technology Officer of Huawei, Mr. Wang Hao. Thank you very much, moderator. Well, as a technology company, uh, we have been operating in Nigeria since 1999, over 20 years to now. So we are ready to invest more, to bring more technologies into the country, to co-develop the fit for purpose technologies for the oil and gas industry in Nigeria, for Nigerian. We want to lower down, join hand together with the ecosystem in country to help reduce your um, um, cost per barrel to reach the ultimate goal uh, eight barrel eight dollars per barrel together thank you thank you very much mr wang um uh, i will just um answer the question that was asked me on the modular refineries before uh, wrapping up so and i'll put in in the in uh, the framework of uh, the topic about operational excellence and portfolio optimization. Now, one of the key strategic imperatives for Watersmith to go into modular refinery was about security um, because we had a lot of challenges of vandalization and um, uh, deferments due to shutdown of the uh, Trans Niger pipeline. And um, also costs, the uh, direct lifting costs and other costs in, you know, involved in uh, the crude handling charges to get our crude to export. Those combined amounted to a significant part of our costs. I would say possibly closer to 40 to 50% of our operating costs were due to these two challenges. And therefore, what we then decided to do was look at modular refining, domestic refining as a way of solving that problem. So 
in trying to address a problem of cost efficiency, which of course directly impacts operational efficiency, we had to diversify our portfolio. So this is how the overall strategy would normally look. So we diversified our portfolio by including um, a modular refining. And we, in, because of the success we have had so far, because when we look at from the time we commissioned the refinery to date, the impact of a uh, lost crew is negligible. Um, it's only the little bit that we probably export that is affected by that. And so looking at that strategy, we intend to expand the refinery to first 30,000 barrels and then to 50,000 barrels. And I would advise other people to take a look at this if they have these same strategic challenges within their areas of operation. Finally, we will transit into gas to power and renewables, like I've said, with solar as the impact renewable uh, in the coming future. So everybody should look at these subjects around the fact that the overall company strategy must have operational excellence. And also that will drive and possibly is symbiotic with their portfolio optimization. So um, I'd honestly like to thank um, standing on existing protocol, um, the, all the representatives from government, the representative of the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, the representative of the GMD NPC, the director DPR who came here himself and you know, personally represented himself, um, the representative of the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board, um, the captains of industry, uh, um, a Reg Africa Regional Director, Professor Wumi Ledari, the Board of Trustees Chairman of the SPE, Mr. Alok Musa, the SPE Nigerian Council Chairman, the current Chairman, um, in the person of uh, Mr. Latunji Akin Wumi, the SPE Nigeria uh, Vice Chairman, Professor Lafoyi, all the SPE Nigerian Council and DOT members here present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. This brings us to the end of what I hope has been a very exciting panel session. And um, as is typical with Oloiburi, uh, there will be a communique which the SP Nigerian Council will take forward and drive into policy making. And also, you know, especially with this NUCOP, support NUCOP and um, the DPR in its efforts to have an optimization uh, platform. So I will now, as moderator, close this panel session and hand back to the Master of Ceremonies. Amazing. Amazing. You would agree with me that a moderator did an excellent job. Please, can we once again give Mr. Chikezia Nwosu a resounding round of applause, please? Thank you. Your Excellencies, very distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. We will be switching gears immediately to the vote of thanks, and this will be taken by the Vice Council Chairman of SPE Nigerian Council. Please help me welcome to the virtual stage, Professor Olale Khan Olafoyi. Please, a round of applause for him as he comes forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would really love to stand on the existing protocol, but for the record, His Excellency, the Noibu Minister of State, Petroleum Resources, Chief Infra Silver, represented by Engineer Rapide Moses, the Group Managing Director of NMPC, Mr. Mele Kiyari, Represented by the CEO upstream, Adokie Tombe Mie, the CEO, the director of DPR, Engineer Awalu Serike, the executive secretary of PTDF, Dr. Bilo Ali Uguzo, represented by Mr. Ajide Adebulei, MDs of companies, the council chairman of SPE. Engineer Tunde Tunji Akinwumi, the BOT members present here, our most valued invited guests, fellow SP members, ladies and gentlemen of the press, 
it is my privilege to have been asked to propose vote of thanks on this year, SP OLEF 2021. As the Vice Council Chairman of SP Nigeria Council, on behalf of the members and leadership of SP in Nigeria, socially say a big thank you to our sponsors, PTDF. We will, every year, they've always been doing that. Walter Smith, Petroman, our own personal person. Shell, Nigeria, Total HMP, and Seplat for your continued tremendous support to SP Nigeria Council, and specifically SP Olubi Lecture Series and Energy Forum. I also want to specially express sincere gratitude to Honorable Minister and other speakers for honoring our invitation and for providing your thoughts on the subject matters brought on the table in this year's SP OLEV. Permit me also to say thank you for to all the invited MDs of companies, both online and in person participants. Your participation is very much appreciated. The discussion from this event will be well documented as mentioned by uh, Yunachike, uh, Mr. Chikeze in a communique for the benefit of our industry post COVID-19. Finally, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to the OLEF 2021 committee chair and all those SP members who have worked tirelessly to make sure we had an excellent event. Permit me to introduce engineer Felix Obike, um, is the vice council chairman elect and The reason I'm introducing him is um, we had a courtesy call to the SDMB Executive Secretary about hosting of the Olo Iberi lecture next year in Bayelsa. So technically, it will be taking over this uh, where I am now. And I know we already have uh, the host company as a sponsor of the event. Am I speaking your mind, sir? <laughs> so um, all things being equal, we'll be holding this lecture physically next year at the Louis Bury site itself. I wish everyone safe journey back home. And as the SP family, we hope to see you in August at SP Nice 2021. Stay safe and thank you for coming. We can do better. Thank you. Sorry, can I ask all the panelists to turn on their video? Yes, please, all panelists, can you turn on your video for the e photograph? Of course, the events. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So at the count of SPE, we will have the shot. S, P, and E. Please can we once again appreciate our panelists for the amazing information they gave us today. Thank you. Okay, Your Excellency is very distinguished and invited guest, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, the event comes to an end, but the conversation on operational excellence and optimization continues. Of course, you will have a quick photograph here in front with our council chair and, of course, all VIPs here. Thank you. Please, can we appreciate them as the head over? Oh, you prefer to go outside? We need the back, we need the background here. Yeah. yeah. So please. Okay. Okay. All the VIPs first with the console chair.
Kauf. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your Excellency is very distinguished invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, lunch is served. So we have the VIP at room five. Of course, the ushers will direct our delegates and VIPs over to the VIP room. And of course, we have room one where all other guests and distinguished personalities can head over for lunch. Once again, we come to the end of... See you, see you sometime this year as we converge once again for NAIS 2021, July 20, 31st and August 1st. Once again, thank you. I go by the name of Ofono Noakwan and we come to the end of this event. Thank you. Sandical team, thank you, thank you.
Oloibiri oil field is named after Oloibiri, a small remote creek community where it is located. It is an onshore oil field located in Oloibiri in Obia local government area of Bayasa State, about 13.75 square kilometers and lies in the swamp within OML 29. After 50 years of unsuccessful oil exploration in Nigeria, the discovery well Oloibiri 1 was spotted on 3rd August 1955 by Shell Dassey and drilled to a total vertical depth of 12,008 feet into the tertiary at Dada Formation. It was tested to rate of about 5,000 barrels of oil per day, making the first commercial discovery in Nigeria and West Africa on Sunday, 15th January 1956. After a 20 year period, the Oloibiri oil field produced over 20 million barrels of oil, and the field was abandoned in 1978 when production ceased. This discovery launched Nigeria into the League of Petrol States. Nigeria became the largest oil and gas producer in Africa and joined Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, in 1971. The era of predictable oil prices ended post-1960s. Besides fluctuating oil price, a problem affecting the petroleum industry is rapidly changing away.